Welcome back to the Exotic Pet Collective. My name is Richard, and we've got an exciting guest today. And I know I say that every single time because I haven't thought of a more interesting intro. Welcome back to the Exotic Pet Collective. A terrible podcast by Tarantula Collective. Today's guest is someone that I've met a few times this summer at different reptile expos across the East. And uh, I think I met him in Kentucky and then again in Tennessee. And we got to hang out in Tennessee for a little bit when we were at the Nashville show, which was very cool. And get to know each other. And we had a good conversation. And I was like, we should be recording this and putting it on a podcast so both sides can, can kind of get out there and... and I don't know. I just really enjoy this guy. He's he's great conversationalist, and uh, we've had some some interesting insights because he's got kind of a different view on the tarantula hobby and husbandry and care and all that kind of stuff. So I want to welcome to the podcast, Marshall. Uh, wait, not Marshall. <laughs> Try that again. So I want to welcome to the podcast Ryan from Marshall Arachnids. <laughs> Sorry about that, buddy. Your name is now Marshall. Perfect. That's what everyone calls me anyway. So that works. <laughs> Hello, Richard. Hi, how are you? I'm good. Thanks, buddy. thanks for coming on, man. I uh, yeah, I really man. enjoy getting to meet you at these expos, especially that the one in Nashville or Lebanon. Technically, I guess we mm -hmm. were. Wait, I always I was saying Lebanon, and they kept it's Lebanon. Lebanon. The, oh, well, then I, I say they were saying too. weird. <laughs> yeah, I, I I don't know <laughs> Lebanon. Now I won't remember. There's probably people listening to the podcast screaming, well, <laughs> but it wasn't Lebanon, like the Middle Eastern country. You're right. I was, yeah, they had a different. I was talking to some guy about it, and he's like. That's where uh, he even pronounced it, whatever the right way is. It's like, that's where Cracker Barrel first started. I'm like, oh. I missed that while I was there. <laughs> so did I. Now I feel silly. All right. Yeah. Okay. But, anyways, our booths were right next to each other. And yep. uh, two days we were shoulder to shoulder and kind of got to know each other a little bit. Yeah. And, uh, you know, had a, some interesting short conversations in between customers. So uh, I thought it would be cool to kind of get you on here. But before we jump into that realm of conversation, Maybe just maybe you could introduce yourself to everyone, kind of let them know who you are, where you're from, what you do, stuff like that. Sure, sure. Yep. So as Richard mentioned, my name is Ryan. I am co-owner, I suppose, at this point. Jess and I run uh, Marshall Arachnids. Uh, we specialize in captive inver uh, invertebrates, uh, specifically tarantulas, but we also sell enclosures and bioactive goods and everything you need to take care of your pet spider. We're originally from Michigan. I started in Michigan, uh, but we now live in Tennessee. I think to really understand my perspective and what I'm bringing to the table here and why this is so um, different than what I think a lot of people hear about the hobby and uh, about care for the animals is, is my background. Um, so let me just kind of, in order to set the stage for our conversation today, I kind of want to just briefly as best I can touch on that. So I started as a hobbyist. I started when I was going to school. I went to school for radiology. I was um, working for a company called Josh's Frogs. Uh, many of you guys have heard of them. They're a titan in the industry. Um, they were right around the block from my school, so it worked out great. I could, uh, uh, in my spare time, go and feed the frogs and go to school, and I was learning. Amphibians were kind of new to me at the time, um, and at, and eventually I was managing, at the time, the largest um, population of captive dendrobatids in the country, arguably. Around uh, what year was this, do you know? Uh, it was 20, I think I started in 2010, maybe 2009. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Working with those guys. Um, and so I was with Josh's for a few years. Um, and then I left to pursue a career in AZA. So I graduated school, I got offered a job. And then um, very quickly, like on the spot, I was like, I'm not going to do this. Like I have to work with animals somehow, some way I got to figure it out. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't want to take care of uh, people. Um, so anyway, so I uh, left to pursue a career in AZA. I didn't know how I was going to do it because I didn't have the schooling at that point. It was kind of too late. Um, most uh, zoologist uh, majors have a bachelor's degree or better. So I moved out to Omaha um, and I got an internship at the Omaha's Henry Dollar Zoo and Aquarium, um, working with reptiles and amphibians. And so from there, um, I realized I had to work really hard. I had to prove myself and kind of set myself apart because again, I didn't have the piece of paper saying I was qualified for a position. So just want to break in for a quick second. <laughs> Please do. Otherwise I'll keep going. <laughs> <laughs> but the, uh, you went to Omaha to, to, and you said you were an intern there. Well, yep. So was that like an unpaid internship or did they... Were yeah. you able to make enough to live off of? Nothing. So that's very important to note. I, I, um, you don't make a whole lot as, as a zookeeper, but as an intern, I was not paid. And I did that for a year. I interned for a full year at the point where the curator of reptiles was like, hey, dude, like eight months in, he's like, you should probably go get a job. Like we know who you are at this point, you know, but yeah. the zoo had been very kind to me um, and they gave me a chance and I was so grateful. So I, I had to prove something, you know, I had to prove that I was better than all these people 
uh, not that better, but you know what I mean? Like worthy of a position versus all these folks who are going to school and doing the proper route. So, so um, how did you pay rent or bills and stuff like that when you're, I, I was married at the time to someone who also got hired as a, 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 a keeper at that position or at, 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 at that zoo. Right. So, um, she was able to make enough to cover her and I was just interning trying to play catch up, you know, different gotcha. departments and whatnot. Yep. Uh, so that's how that worked. It, it was still, t- it was still pretty tight. Zookeepers are, um, criminally underpaid. So, um, <laughs> anyway, so we, we made it work though, but in, in that, during that internship, I learned a lot. So let me be very clear. I am not a zoologist. I am not a scientist. I am not a biologist. Um, but at this institution, I was surrounded by folks who were all of those things, scientists, biologists, veterinarians, blah, 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 top of their field. Uh, Omaha's Henry Diller Zoo was, is a world-renowned institution. So they hire good people, the best in their field. So again, I had to be a sponge and like take in all of this stuff, like all of this information about, you know, I, I knew ectotherms, but I really, there was the nitty gritty science and how that applied to husbandry. I really had to take that all in. And I think what changed my life was, um, I was offered um, as an intern to go to Honduras on an amphibian conservation project. So go there and study the animals. And then uh, basically what we did is we built these mobile laboratories in Omaha to then ship them down there in the mountains and then bring the amphibians into captivity, clear them of a disease called chytrid or chytridiomycosis, which is a fungal uh, pathogen uh, that's still spreading throughout the world. But the point is, is like these animals were endemic to this place and um it was our job to study them, figure out what, what makes them tick, where, well, how are they being affected, where are they being affected. Let's bring them into captivity, let's clear them of this disease, and let's help them out, right? And AZA institutions have a box to check, you know, so much of their income has to go to conservation of some scale, right? So it looks good on paper for them, and it gives keepers a good idea if you work your ass off to do something cool, go to a foreign country, save animals. So, and I was lucky enough to land that spot. So I didn't get paid or anything. It was just the opportunity to go. So anyway, I, when I got back, I got offered the position. I bounced around to a couple different institutions trying to get full time. And then pandemic happened and, you know, politics happened just like everywhere else, whether you're a zookeeper or you work at McDonald's or a big corporation. And I thought, um, let's, let's start doing this arachnid thing. I totally skipped over the arachnid part, but you did. <laughs> when I was at, when I was at Josh's, so let's talk about that real quick. When I was at Josh's okay. kind of passively without making a big stir about it, you know, I, I was an arachnophobe my whole life. And, um, the girl I was dating at the time, she presented me with a uh, Ephibopus murinus and I, you know, I was terrified, but when she put it in my hand, I, I was blown away at how calm it was but relatively passively gentle, but I could tell like the animal is so aware of everything going on around it, but it's just, it was very calm. So that was a life-changing moment for me. Um, and then she had showed me a picture of Postlotheria metallica, the sapphire ornamental, the blue one. And I was like, is that a real animal? Like I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. Like that's a real spider. She goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I you know, I looked up and you know, they're really expensive. I knew I wanted one. She's like, you should probably yeah. slow your roll, you know, like <laughs> le- learn about them and understand their behavior. And, um, you know, but the thing she said was they're hard, they're tricky to breed in captivity. It's difficult to capture the seasonal changes. And, you know, my ego kicked in at the time. I was like, I'm going to do it. And so I did it. I, I, I got my first pair. It was like a six month project. I figured it out. I bred them. And it, passively, that is what spawned martial arachnids. So the, the captive success of breeding that animal. And so you initially started martial arachnids how long ago? Um, I think, well, the LLC is only like two or three years old, probably three years old, but I was keep, I've been keeping arachnids now, for, I think for probably six, five, six years. So uh, you started in Michigan, right? I did. Yeah. Okay. yeah where, where it's uh, quite a bit cool. If you know anything about Michigan, the, the winters are brutal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Summers are hot. Winters are cold. But yep. Started in Michigan. Um, I took those animals all to the different uh, zoological institutions that I worked with. But yeah, it was just a small baker's rack. I had a few of that one species and uh, that's how it started. But so. now you are in, you recently just moved to Tennessee. You got it. Yep. Middle of nowhere, mountains, mountains everywhere, surrounded by no one, surrounded by nothing. Um, yeah, we, we, we did it. We did it. So Jess and I moved down here. We built an animal room where we can climate control everything and everything's nice and warm and we live up above the animal room now. So yeah, man, we're all in, but we are now in Tennessee. Nice. Uh, are you liking it? So far. I love it, man. Yeah, yeah, I love it. It's it's definitely the our it matches the inside, if that makes yeah. any sense, you know. So <laughs> definitely so. a, definitely our pace. So Yeah. 
Yeah, I was actually watching a YouTube video the other day. Uh, it was some guy, he, I don't know where he's from, Los Angeles or some big city. And then he like lived in Ukraine for a little bit and then came back to America. And while he was in Ukraine, he started making these videos where he would just like go live with a family for a week or something like that and kind of like nice. get an idea of what the daily life is of someone in Czechoslovakia or, you know, whatever. So when he came back, he started doing that here. So he's mm. like going to like, Compton and Alaska and Native American tribes and cool. you know places like that where you know you, you kind of get stereotypical ideas kind of of what is going on there, but not really anybody's ever there doing anything. And he did a bunch of stuff in West Virginia, okay, and, yeah, uh, you know Appalachians and, and people like that. And watching that video or those videos, I was like, I don't know if I'm ever going to move from this area. Like yeah. I've been all over the place, and and I like a lot of the stuff that are in bigger cities and and the people and the food and just all the different cultures. But like when it comes down to it, this is where I feel safe and at home and comfortable. Yes. And, and it's just beautiful and having the woods, you know what I mean? Like yeah. I'm in a city, but I can drive 20 minutes and be completely, like be in the middle of nowhere. Yes. So it's really easy to lose a cell phone signal out here. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. That's very well put. Yeah. Yeah. I think more people need that. We're very disconnected from, yeah. from that feeling. Yeah, I keep saying I want to move to like Arizona or New Mexico or, or somewhere where tarantulas live naturally, really, and, and kind of be in that environment. But then I'm like, I don't think I can do it. I think I'd miss the mountains too much. I'm with you there, man. Yeah, <laughs> grass is always greener on the other side, but you got to yeah. really, you got you got to listen to what's going on in your gut. You know, yeah, like, yeah, what makes sense. Yeah. So so yeah, you're in the you're in the Smoky Mountains now, right? So pretty close to them. Yeah, we're on yeah. a mountain range. We're about we're a couple hours away from the Smokies, but we're on oh, a, yeah. in the Cumberland Plateau. Um, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. So it's still a mountain range, but nothing like the Grand Smokies. So gotcha. Yeah, they're everywhere out here. You know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because I was I was looking at the Appalachian. I don't know. I just I just really enjoy those that area, and just it was it was this big controversy on what Appalachia actually refers to. So some yeah. people were saying like the entire mountain range that it goes from like Georgia all the way up to Maine. And other people are like, no, it's a specific area kind of in the middle. That's the most rural. And it was just, okay. know, it was just kind of interesting. It is. And I was like, Tennessee kind of sometimes falls in it, sometimes doesn't. But West it Virginia does. is like the only state that's like 100% within, no matter what you do. And yes. West Virginia is always Appalachia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. There's some really cool art that comes out of artists in in, in, in Appalachia, really. Like yeah. I, I, I really think whatever's happening where you're at is it, it. People do a good job of putting it on paper. Like I see, there's a lot of artists that come out of that are really cool and like cryptid kind of stuff going on. It, yeah. it's not, I've never. I, I mean, I've driven through it, uh, yeah. so I get I get where that's coming from. But yeah, it sounds like a really neat place. Oh yeah, all kinds of cryptids around here. And, oh yeah, yeah. And <laughs> UFOs and all kinds of stuff. Dude, but, I'm, I'm all about it. <laughs> but it's it's also like in the town I live in, it's we, like I would think if I was in another, I mean, either side of the spectrum, like all really liberal or really conservative, they'd probably have an mm -hmm. issue with what I do for a living. Sure. Uh, I feel it, that. It's, it's weird and different. And yep. they, there's a whole bunch of different reasons they would dislike it. That's not the same, but they wouldn't approve of it. <laughs> but like it's this weird kind of town that's, uh, I probably shouldn't have said the name of the town where I live. <laughs> <laughs> we'll beat that. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very uh, cool town just because it's like, uh, people think West Virginia, they think super conservative. And it's like, Big well, time. it was super Democrat up until recently. So it's like a okay. mix of really they just care about who's going to protect their rights the most and, and right. give them the freedoms that they want. You know, the, the, yep. whoever's the most restrictive, that's who doesn't get voted for. Yep. Uh, I feel that here too, for so sure. So it's like this town is just full of artists and, cool. and actors and, and painters and musicians. You know what I mean? There's a lot of this, but it's also, it's, it's not San Francisco. You know what I mean? Right. It's a strange mix of like artists, but also common sense. That's yes. Like, yeah. Just try and not get political. I don't know. It's 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 a cool little town. I like it. It sounds neat. I want to come visit. Yeah, you definitely yeah, I want to drive to. through. I'm going. We've got that uh that Tri-State Exotic Animal Expo twice a year, sometimes three times a year in Moundsville. You're, you're going to have to come if for no other reason and to yep. just hang out for a weekend. Like, don't even think of it as business. Just think of it as, yes. I'm going to take a vacation. I'm going to go hang out inside of a haunted prison with some tarantula dealers and reptile dealers and bullshit yeah. for two days. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe sell some spiders. I, I and then care. we have like a tradition where after the Saturday show, we all go out to eat. All the tarantula people usually cool. eat balls. Yeah. 
he keeps he keeps bailing on us, but he's got family here. He's so he's uh, <laughs> but okay. and then we go out to eat, then we come back here to the studio and we hang out, maybe breed some spiders and gossip and have a good yeah. time. So it'd be great if you and Jess could come down sometime. Oh, we would love to, man. Yeah, let's awesome. we'll, we'll plan it for sure. Yeah. And that would like great. give us the ability to have more conversations like we were having in Nashville about husbandry. Yeah. Very because yes. Kind of realized and I understand where your frustration comes. Like the first time we met, I don't know, was that where was that? That was that in was Louis, in right? St. Louis at a barbecue yeah. joint. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. We sat down next to each other, and like I knew who you were just from social media and from your business. Right. I didn't know you very well. And, yeah, uh, I want to give you props. I want to speak to a certain sector um, because, like what you said, um, I've I've come out. Um, of, of, I guess the shell swinging a little bit, you know, and I've been, a, have told Richard many times, I've been a really big fan of how you package information and deliver it. And I, you know, I hear, I told you, I hear your name all the time. And I'm like, yes, everything you're doing is, is fantastic for the hobby. I really love it. But where we clash was our information. So like, like what we're, what we're giving to not our customers, so to speak, but our, our viewership, our customers is, is, is different. So it's been interesting to watch the reactions of folks, you know, and Jess and I are obviously very passionate, but you know, like I said, I've been very critical of, of not just your work, but the work that, um, a lot of influencers or social media folks or whoever, you know, any of the names you can think of in the hobby, like the information they put out. I did not expect you to be there when we sat down for dinner that one time. And I was just like, well, uh, we'll see how this goes, you know? Um, yeah. And, and you had every right to be like, ah, eh, man, you're kind of a jerk. Like, I don't want nothing to do with you. Like, go away. You know, but you were so receptive and you were super cool and you've always been willing to hear me out. And, and, and here we are, you know, so yeah. I, and I want to give you props for that because people can criticize your work all day long and mine included. I mean, since day one, I've been criticized, but you know, there's something to be said for that, that we can sit here and, and have these conversations and get ego out of the way and just kind of like come together and like let people decipher for themselves or, you know, cause there's so many different ways to do these things, you know, and I just, right. I, I want to commend you for that. I think that's really neat. Well, thank so. you. But I think you should tell everybody how, and this is my, my memory. It may not be true because my brain warps things. <laughs> oh, exaggerates. Okay. You got too much going time. on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it, yeah. my recollection is kind of decided last minute to, to go, didn't really know a lot of the people that were going to be there. It was just kind of tarantula cat was like, no, we're going to get barbecue. You got to eat some barbecue while you're in St. Louis. And I was like, yep. all right. Because I'm like, get done with the show. I want to go back to the hotel room and stay there until I fall asleep. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, that was too many easy. people for too many hours in a row. Like, I just yeah, to, I don't know how you For that. a while. And then, yeah. Yeah. It's like, all right, we'll go get something to eat. And we I ended up sitting down next to you or you sat down next to me. I don't remember. Yep. But we were side by side. Yep. And you, the first thing you said like I, at least in my memory <laughs> was, oh, I know you. I have I hear about you all the time. <laughs> yes, exactly. I said, Richard, I hear your name a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I could just sense the not really resentment, but just no. like frustration of like we got. And you said something that I hear. Yeah, you're yeah, like we got. To, and then and I hear yeah. that a lot from dealers and uh, mm -hmm. breeders and you know just just old heads online even. But you know they're, they're just kind of. They have this uh, frustration, mainly with dealers and breeders. That yeah, they and they they have this animal. They breed it. They raise it. You know, from an egg sac to a spiderling or a juvenile or even an adult in some situations, and they're selling it to somebody, and right. they're telling them, as the person that bred and raised this animal, this is how I take care of it. This is what's been yeah. successful. They take it and then be like, oh, this guy on the internet said to do something else. So I'm going to do that. And then yeah. the animal ends up, you know, getting sick or just not being well or dying. And, and they're like, they want, you know, a replacement or they're like, oh, this is a bad breeder. But when in reality, right. they're not keeping the spider in the way that it had been kept for its entire life. Correct. Uh, and, and I just saw a video on, um, we were just talking about this before we started recording, uh, but on the uh, NERD or Donnie Rapture where he was talking about a customer who was in a similar situation. I mean, they they're reptiles, so it's a little bit different. We'll get into that sure. uh, a yeah. little bit further on. But they were talking about, they had this like green tree boa and they kept it mm. in a very specific type of enclosure with specific humidities and temperatures and lighting or whatever. And they sold it to this guy and his was having problems. Just was not, it was just being really lethargic and mm -hmm. essentially was dehydrated. And they said, hey, change your husbandry. And he got really defensive. Like, oh, I've mm. been doing this for years. I know what I'm doing. This is what the people on the internet are saying. This is how I should keep it. And it was yeah. like one of the most well-explained situations where it was like, well, the people on the internet may not be dumb. They may be right. And you have experience keeping this species. You may be right. 
but this particular specimen came from this particular breeder from this particular situation. And these are the conditions that it needs to be kept in right now immediately to thrive and survive. Right. And then you can slowly transition it to the type of husbandry and enclosure that you want to keep it in, but you can't right. just rip it from one situation to another and expect it to adapt and have no problems whatsoever. You're right. And I was just like, and, and that kind of like turned a light on for me because we've had, uh, you know, this conversation a few times, but when I saw that video yesterday, the day before I was, I was, it really kind of hit home uh, to like, mm-hmm. the difference between some idiot on the internet telling you what to do and the person you actually buy the animal for. hundred percent. Yeah. You know, it's like, maybe that person has, decades of experience, but they aren't, they don't have the intimate, like when I make a video, I guess about a tarantula species, I just say, this is what I'm doing. I'm not telling yep. you what to do, but this is how I take care of it. This is what works for me. And I put that out there, but I'm not saying that John Smith that lives in Tucson, Arizona, keeping his tarantula in this room should do this and be successful. It's like, well, right. I didn't sell you the spider. I don't live in that environment. I don't know what you're uh, indoor temperatures or humidities are. There's a whole bunch of variables that kind of go into it that you you need to adapt. And, and whatever you read on the internet, you need to change it, I guess, to kind of fit your circumstance. And yes. the reason you and I started talking is because you kind of had a different view mm-hmm. on husbandry. Mm-hmm. And the, the, what I put out there in my videos and what you tell your customers, there was some, some conflict or, uh, you know, uh, there were some differences in that. So yeah. I was thinking maybe just to start off, you could kind of explain a little bit about what these differences are or what your approach to husbandry is. And yeah. then we kind of, kind of go from there. Okay. Yeah, let's do that. Um, right. inter- interrupt me and, and interject because <laughs> otherwise I'm going to keep going. Okay. We'll so, <laughs> okay. Okay. So since, since Jess and I started keeping the spiders or even I could start keeping way before Jess. So ever since then, if you don't already know what we're all about, we look at them through a bit of a different lens. So uh, we, we are under the assumption that the very foundation in which the tarantula hobby has been built upon is fundamentally broken. Um, and I'm going to explain that um, as best I can. And Richard, by all means, feel free to chime in. But I will. I think, I think we just need to bring it back a little bit and then just let's just start with the very basics. Okay, so what is a tarantula? A tarantula is an ectotherm. What is an ectotherm? An ectotherm is an animal that is cold-blooded Okay, it does not generate its own body heat. It uh, relies on its environment to do so. Now, tarantulas are a very specific type of ectotherm called a poikilotherm. Okay, now this is this is not an opinion. This this is just fact. Okay, a poikilotherm. What is it? It is an animal that regulates its body temperature by behavioral means. Okay, specifically basking or burrowing, um, and you can Google that. That's not my opinion. That's just a, a, a biological fact of what these animals are. That's how they have evolved to thrive in their specific environments. So what that means is, is the tarantulas themselves are capable of thermal regulation. In fact, they need to thermoregulate to grow, to survive, to support metabolic processes all involved in growth and reproduction, right? What that means is that in a very specific environment, they capitalize on thermal gradients. Okay. And again, it's not my opinion. This is just how the animals have evolved. So... What that means is they thermoregulate, they're able to detect changes, small gradients and heat and cool, um, and they use those gradients throughout the day um, in their native environments to, again, reproduce and to survive, right? Can you give us some examples? Like, uh, are we talking about uh, they, they move to kind of thermoregulate uh, on yes. the gradient for like comfort or for digestion or for mating purposes or like, yes. what is it based upon? Thank you. Yep. So any metabolic process or, or re- reproductive process, right? So again, ectotherms are cold-blooded, meaning heat is energy. Heat is a unit of energy for a poikilotherm specifically, right? And in order to capitalize on that energy, they will move, they, thermo, they, they bask or burrow, meaning they move to where it is warm or cool in order to regulate what their body needs at that time. Um, so uh, metabolic processes such as molting, reproducing, uh, after a meal, they will usually seek out slightly, uh, you know, higher gradients of temperatures to um, digest or to reproduce, whatever. Now, this sense? concept isn't something that is 
really controversial in the hobby. I mean, it's something that we all kind of know. Like we, we tell people, uh, well, I mean, first we like, Hey, don't use heat pads, but if you use a heat pad, don't put it on the bottom of the enclosure. Cause the tarantula will burrow down yeah. for, for cooler temperatures. And Smart. It, okay. You know? So, I mean, that's something yep. that we know. That's something that is, uh, at least when you're like in Facebook groups and stuff, that's something that is constantly said. Like if, if mm-hmm. you use a lot of heat pad, put it on the side, on the back, yeah. put it on the bottom. So people yeah. know this, that, that tarantulas will burrow. Correct. Um, just for anybody, yeah. this guy's full of crap. It's like, well, that, you know, he, it's, but this is so far, everything you said is, at least to my knowledge, is fact. Correct. That is fact. And and I want to point out something very specific, too, is that in nature, there's some nuance, but heat comes from the top down, right? So it is very instinctual for poikilotherms to go down or inward to escape heat or to cool their bodies. That is instinctual. Okay. So just because we take them from the wild and we put them in a box in our living room, it doesn't negate that million, millions of years of evolution. That is still instinctually how they are programmed to survive uh, in their environments. So, so yes, putting a heat pad underneath them to raise the ambient temperatures, although you might have the best of intentions, that is something that is contradictive to their biology. That it's not really how they work. Right. That's not how they're wired. Um, and the same goes for like a heat, a heat lamp. You know, if, if you know, I got to I have to get this out there because I still see this, guys, and it drives me nuts. But, it, you know, they'll say a tarantula will cook itself. Again, if you're listening to what everything I've been saying, that is contradictive. That doesn't play with their, again, millions of years of evolutionary biology. They, they absolutely thermoregulate. If you put, if you have them in a box that's this big and you put a big bulb that's not rated for that space you give them to properly thermoregulate, that will cook the spider. To, yeah. You'll need to describe it with your words because some lot of people are listening. So when you say this big, they have yeah. no idea. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So for, j- this is going to be an extreme, but I know this is where this has come from. If you have a five gallon glass aquarium or a 10 gallon and you mm. put a 125 watt mercury vapor bulb or something on top of it because again instinctually you're like it's too cold in my house and then you put that bulb on there and you turn that on that animal effectively because that that device is so powerful does it cannot get away from that heat even though it might want to right so the spider is not cooking itself you're not giving it adequate you're giving it too much Okay, and so that's where that is coming from. And we need to squash that <laughs> right now because people thinking that they can't thermoregulate, I think does a lot more harm than good in the hobby. Even though the best of intention is, oh, don't cook your spider. Well, there's nuance to that, right? Uh, Go ahead. I'm a little unclear what you were like. So you're saying that tarantulas aren't getting cooked by heat lamps? <laughs> no, I'm saying oh, that okay. it's possible that they are getting okay. cooked, but they're not doing it themselves. It's, gotcha. it's a, that's an example of poor husbandry. They're, if, 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 if you cook your spider, it's because you gave it something that is effectively too much, too hot to, in order for the animal to thermoregulate, right? You cook the, you bake the enclosure and that's yeah. not just specific to invertebrates. That's any captive ec- ectotherm period. You know, you have to I mean, do I, little- I've got the emails so I can show you <laughs> people send me photos of their setup. Like my tarantula died. What did I do wrong? And usually, and I'm not like knocking these countries, but it's usually somebody that's from Scotland or the UK sure. or Canada or somewhere that's like more Northern Cooler. and it's a lot colder. Yep. And they're like, you know, my, maybe my house is like in the low 60s or mid 60s during the winter. And we just don't yep. turn the heat on up that high. Yeah. Uh, and and they use like a huge heat pad or right. I know initially my first spider, I had a heat rock in there. But right. like that, that's what they told me at the pet store I needed. And, uh, you know, so like I, you, you see that, but I, I mean, I've got pictures and they have this like massive 100 watt like ceramic heater or something like yes. that. So you, you cooked your tarantula and it's like, it's not just like... I understand where they're coming from wanting to have like a warm spot. But yes. It was so big, right. the entire enclosure, like it was a way too big for the enclosure itself or, you know, what the situation and like they couldn't keep it cool enough, like on the bottom and like the, the cocoa fiber and everything was bone dry, you know? Yeah. Like, crunchy. I'm overflowing the water dish every day. And it's like, yeah, but it's evaporating like within an hour. Yes. Yeah. That's what I was going to ask. Well, how do we avoid the desiccation? Because like well, I've seen that it definitely happens. I've witnessed it happen like with my first tarantula. Because what happened to me is I left to go to Florida for a week or something, mm-hmm. a couple of weeks. And, and I had somebody, uh, essentially it was like February. So it was nice and warm down there. I thought the tarantula would be fine. I had fed it. The heat was on or whatever. And then the power went out mm. uh, while I was gone and didn't get turned back on. Or I don't know, a circuit broke. Like, you know what I mean? So it was like yeah. some power was on. But the the 
essentially the AC and the heater was out. Got so it. there were lights. The heat rock was working, but it was like, other than that, like my, the water in the toilet bowl froze. You know what oh, I mean? Wow. So it was like, yeah. I don't know if the tarantula cooked itself because it stayed on the heat rock the entire time or if it froze to death. Sure. But I came back and it was dead. And I was like, oh, that's terrible. Um, yeah, that hurts. So, yeah, it was, I, I see that, like, you say something online, like you tell people, use a heat lamp. Mm-hmm. And there's always going to be somebody that's going to get the biggest, fanciest, most powerful heat lamp and use it. Just like if right. I say, you know, in most situations, it's not a good idea to use a heat pad. There are people that will take that to an extreme and be like, under Correct. no circumstance should, should any additional heat be given to an tarantula. You know, people like, right. they, the things go through this filter when they hear that and and and, and it's, it becomes a black and white situation. Like everything has yes. to left or right, you know, right you, or wrong. You nailed it. Yep. Um, You're right. So, you nailed it. So how do people, because I know people right now, they just heard you say that you, or insinuate that you can use a heat lamp for a tarantula, yeah. which goes against 20 years at least. I remember the first tarantula keeper's guide that I got had uh, a set, like a paragraph, even a drawing showing a, an incandescent light inside of mm. the aquarium in a very small amount of substrate, but saying they needed that heat. Uh-huh. And then that kind of just disappeared because we're like, oh, they're, they're, we're going to cook the tarantulas. Right. And the common, and I'm sure everybody listening knows this, but like the common kind of theory or, a, a, you know, kind of accepted husbandry is that, you know, uh, I, and I say it in a lot of videos, like if you're comfortable, your tarantula is comfortable and people mm. are like, not really mad at me. I'm like, I got that from somebody. I think it, you know, I, oh, I, yeah. there's another tarantula YouTuber that I heard it from when I was learning. That's the you know, so it's just something that I kind of repeated because it's worked for me so far in, in most situations. Sure. Uh, so it just kind of goes like tarantulas are comfortable at room temperature. And yep. what I've, the feeling that I've always had is if it gets too cold, the tarantula will come out of its burrow and, and bask in the sun to kind of hit that like, you know, 80 mm-hmm. degree mark. And then if it starts getting, you know, above 80 outside in the sun, it'll move to the shade or it'll go down to its burrow to kind of cool. So Correct. by providing them with temperature range around 75, you're essentially giving them the optimal conditions that they want. Like, because you're saying they thermoregulate. Mm-hmm. So they have, if, if you don't have a heat lamp, you don't have a heat pad, you keep it at 75 or 72 or whatever, then the tarantula is happy and it won't need to thermoregulate. Okay. So why is it that you feel it is important uh, to, to have that kind of temperature gradient within an enclosure? Perfect. Yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad you're phrasing it this way because these are ways that I don't necessarily understand like the point of view. So 75 Fahrenheit. So let's, let's, let's back up. I think the roadmap needs to change a little bit as to how we meet these parameters. Okay, so what we, un- we, what we have to understand is there's a set of parameters that an animal from a very specific place is experiencing, right? So let's just say for the sake of, let's just say Carabina versicolor. That is a very common species in the hobby. People really struggle with slings um, and we can get to that uh, if you want to, but like that animal, um, 75 to 85 all year round, that is its range. Okay. It might be, it might dip a little bit, might go a little bit higher. Um, it has the ability from day to night to warm up or cool down or within the confines of wherever it's hiding in its web hammock, you know, but there's always going to be a, like a, like a flat line. And let's just say for the sake of the species we're talking about right now, 75 degrees. Okay. So that's where like, that's where it's, it's a happy medium, Right. But it doesn't stay there. And that animal um, at some point, either, you know, two weeks from now, a week from now, a day from now, like it's going to eat, it's going to want to reproduce, it's going to want to molt. Right. Which is very expensive for that animal to do. It's very taxing. It's very costing. So I could take you in my room right now and show you 18 versicolor that are all stuck uh, basking close to their LED lights, right? They're all about to molt or they just had a sack. They just had a clutch hatch. They're recovering, right? And the base, the, the baseline in my room is 75 Fahrenheit. So they're being exposed to temperatures that are 80, 85. And that's how we're quantifying this is how do you quantify? How do you, how do you know? How, like they're going to survive at 75, but how do you know you can take it beyond that and give them something more? Well, behavior, behavior is a language and that's what we're watching. And we know that it corresponds with what they do in the wild, right? Because, because we've done our research, we know natural history, blah, blah, blah. And so when the animal is, is, is choosing, we're giving them that option of choice. And what that does is that um, gives the animal a better chance of molting or recovering or digesting because it has access to those gradients that they have naturally evolved to use. So the one thing I really want to clarify is heat lamp doesn't just mean heat lamp. Uh, 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 we have so many 
tools. I use LEDs. I do use some um, halogens for some of my post-lithereal we can talk about. But I use passive LEDs and that's enough. An LED grow light is enough to give an animal 10 degrees of gradients within like a 12 by 12 by 18 or 8 by 8 by 12 exoterra. So it doesn't have to be this very elaborate, very dangerous, very um, powerful piece of equipment to use to give your animal just that little bit of extra that it might need to either molt faster. You know, I hear this all the time. We get this all the time. Oh, it's warm out where I live. All my animals are molting like crazy. They're molting like crazy. And I don't know why. They're just, yeah, the warm weather's got them going nuts. It's like, well, they have access for that brief moment of time to something that's greater than room temperature. And, and that might coincide with something that they have access to on a daily basis where they live naturally, right? Mm-hmm. So you're just allowing that animal to capitalize on a stimulus that it has access to on a daily basis. So I think we need to quit going to these extremes of like, well, I'm not just going to put a basking light or, oh, I, I've never done that and my animal's fine. Sure. And it's a little nuance to that. And, and what, I re- what I really want to have people understand is like people who are just getting into this, who have never kept an animal before, they're seeing that whole, if you're comfortable, I'm comfortable. Um, or if, if they're comfortable, I'm comfortable, whatever, vice versa. You know, they're seeing all of this in- information that the internet is just inundated with. And they're just, it's a shoulder shrug. We're creating a culture of like, they're fine. You know, yeah. when, when in some cases, like we talked about the keeper in Arizona versus Michigan or what, vice versa, you know, there needs to be a better roadmap to this because that's not always going to be the case. Now, I understand the the counter argument, which is, well, like what Richard said, don't take a mercury vapor bulb and blast and cook your animal. But like, of course not. You know, to me, that's always been common sense. It's like, well, right, right. A little little research into like what that that tool is pr- producing for that animal. You know what I mean? A little, yeah. little bit, just a little bit of measurement. You know, I'm not saying you have to maintain a specific number, but that's how you avoid accidents is knowing what you're giving that spider within the space you've provided it or any animal. Right. You just yeah. you're aware of that before you just blast it with something like that. That's going to that's going to kill anything. And sure. like not, not just a spider, you know, so. Right. Yeah. I remember the first time I came across some of your content, uh, probably on Facebook. You were talking about enclosures. It's kind of like a live stream kind of deal. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I don't remember why. I think somebody sent it to me like, hey, this guy's talking crap on you. And I watched mm-hmm. it. I was like, I don't feel like he's talking crap on me. <laughs> he just has a different opinion. But yeah. they got me to watch. And uh, I don't think you call me up by name, but maybe. I don't remember. <laughs> not <laughs> so maybe. Like but, I said, I was critical. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Of not just but it, you, but everyone. Yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and I remember thinking at the time, watching you know, kind of your theory. And we'll, we'll get more into, into that here in a second. Uh, sure. So, so you can fully explain to people exactly how you set up an enclosure or think they should be set up. Sure. I just remember thinking this dude is overcomplicating a peanut butter sandwich, essentially. Yes, I'm so glad you said that. Because yeah. when I came in, like I remember, it, and, and I again, I'm, I'm going to try to avoid using names, throwing anyone under the bus, but I remember like the standard idea set up for a tarantula was you, you go to Walmart, you buy one of those big Sterilite tubs for a couple of dollars, you yep. drill some holes into it or, or melt some holes into it. Uh, you fill it up halfway with cocoa fiber, put in a water dish and a, a half round cork bark yep. as a hide and put the lid on it and leave them alone and take them out when you feed them and, and look at them. And initially that was how I was, I was like, this is how people keep them. This is how I'm going to keep them because it's sure. simple, it's easy, it's cheap. And then quickly I found out, well, I can't really see the spiders unless I pull the lid off and then they're all upset and freaked out. Right. I want to be able to watch them just kind of chilling out and, and relaxing and walking yeah. around. Yeah. So, we started moving more towards the more expensive glass enclosures and that has progressed over the years. But like, I, I remember initially spending 150 bucks or hundred bucks or something on an exoterra glass enclosure and posting yeah. a photo years and years ago and getting pushback from people like that is excessive. Like you don't need that nice of an enclosure for a tarantula. Sure, and and I don't. just remember thinking at that moment, like you don't, but and, and part of this had to do with my wife. She was like, you can have as many spiders. I mean, she changed her tune later, but she's like, you can have as many spiders as you want, as long as they all look nice. Okay. Later, she was like, yeah. okay, you can't fit any more spiders in the basement. You got to stop. Uh, but it, that was so that was kind of what inspired me. I was like, I want them to look as naturalistic as possible, or at least yes. pleasing to the eye. Yeah. And be beautiful, but also kind of replicate the environment they're from and give them the best possible life. So it's not just Perfect. a bare, empty room. Yep. And the pushback I got on that, I, I was surprised. Uh, and But I kept, you know, kept doing my thing. Essentially, the husbandry was the same. I just used fancier enclosures and fancier decorations. And I mean, there's all kinds of don't use this type of rock or don't use this. It's, this is too heavy or this is too bright or this is sure. too warm. You know, there's all these like people out there with crazy ideas because 
of anecdotal evidence. They knew a guy who had this rock and that spider died unexplained. So it must be the rock. Yep. And I found that, that I'd set up an avicularia enclosure. It was, it was either avicularia or it was, um, I think I did for two of them. The other one was, uh, it was Omothymus violicepes. I'm not okay. sure what it is now, but the, the Singapore blue tarantulas. Yep. Kind of arboreal, they, they liked high heat, but high humidity, and they needed to burrow. But also, you know, it, it was yeah. kind of a, a fancy spider. And I overcomplicated the hell out of it and bought this like big 20-gallon breeder tank tall because it was nice. really tall so i had like dirt kind of uh kind of on a hill on one side okay so it had plenty of dirt to burrow but the other side just a small amount of dirt so they had a bunch of branches and stuff so it could do its arboreal thing and yep. i just see some really cool behavior but i was using a heat pad and maybe a heat lamp mm -hmm. i think it was a heat lamp at first and just because it was so large i wanted to have a i, I was like i can do a temperature gradient in this and see okay. what first yeah, and then when that spider died, that was immediately what all the comments were. It, it turned out she uh, it was too humid in there. Is mm -hmm. what I think. I, sure. I overdid it with yep. the humidity, so it was and it didn't have cross ventilation, and it was just it was just stagnant. You know, I think that's what did it. Not necessarily the heat lamp, but I remember that was initially everybody's. Well, it's because you had a heat lamp. We, oh yeah, everybody knows a heat lamp kills spiders. Mm -hmm. And I kind of was like internalized that, like yeah, that yep. was. I tried something, it failed. It must have been the heat lamp. Okay. Uh, but then as time went on, I tried it again with a, um, a Vicularia. I think that's what it was. The Vicularia was second. But mm -hmm. initially what I did is I had one of those, I think they were the mercury bulbs, yep. like the heat lamp bulbs that are really tiny. I don't even know if they sell them anymore. Oh, hell, they're little halogens. Yeah, that's yep. what it was. Yeah, I was I using one of those and like a, it, because I, I bought a kit at, at the pet store. It was like a Zilla Tropical Arboreal Enclosure. Yeah. And it yeah. came with one of those. Okay. And so I used it. And uh, thinking that it would replicate the temperature because I was like, I essentially just Googled, you know, what are the conditions where the avicularia avicularia is? And it just awesome. kind of gave you a, a general idea. This is the temperature. This is the humidity. And I was like, I need to replicate that. Yep. And I used the heat lamp and it, and it ended up not going. I think the heat lamp ended up burning out. I just never they replaced it. And the spider yeah. lived fine for many years. So I was like, well, yep. definitely. And then I started realizing that that was an, an issue in my research. And I think a lot of people fall for that is that I would I was looking up what the average temperature is in on this island in the mm -hmm. tropics. You know what I mean? Like, I guess it was probably Guyana or something like that. Uh, yeah. Specifically. But, you know, even when I do like things on, like I'm making a video right now about uh, Costa Rica. Cool. And, you know, you, you search what are the, like, uh, I was looking for na nature static shots. Like somebody just set up a camera yep. and filmed the, you know, the leaves, you know, kind of blowing in the wind or something. And it was amazing. Just on Costa Rica, there were like extreme tropical jungles. There were like rocky scrublands. There were beaches. Yeah. There were, you know what I mean? Like it was a wide variety of kind of environments. Yeah. Uh, and, and so I was like, why? Well, by just searching what the average temperature is and the average humidity does not give me nearly enough information about what the spider needs. Right. Uh, particularly with avicularia because it was having really high temps, really high humidity yep. in the natural environment on average. But when yes. you look at the temperatures by season, there was some big swings. Yep. But more importantly, we looked where the spider lived, where it chose to make its burrow. It was always kind of up in the uh, eaves of buildings Mm -hmm. Fence posts up in trees, somewhere where there's a lot of wind blowing all the time. Yes. And it's higher up off the ground. So it's like, it's not as humid. It's not as warm as right. the average, for the, if that makes sense. So it's like, yeah. I am keeping it at the, the, at the temperature, at the conditions that it's trying to escape in nature. It's trying okay. to find somewhere yeah. less humid, less cool. And sure. I am creating what it's trying to escape. So that was, so that, that kind of formed my opinion. And, and what I tell people a lot of times, like, yeah, well, maybe the temperature in Arizona is 100 degrees. But the Afonim Helmet Cow Cody's doesn't want to live in a hundred degree enclosure. Yeah. Yes. So, you know, how do you reconcile like some of that, like with, from that opinion, like that, that's where I'm coming from. Yep. Uh, I don't want to replicate the environment that is trying to escape in nature. Correct. I want to, if I'm going to replicate an environment, I want it to be what it, its ideal is within the area that it's living. Right. Uh, so how do you, how do you reconcile keeping the tarantula safe and comfortable and in ideal conditions while also trying to simulate like what you're doing, like giving them that temperature gradient or the humidity gradient. And then, yeah. It, and then and I'm assuming, I don't know if you said this or not, I kind of got sidetracked for a second, but do you change the parameters of the husbandry as the seasons go to encourage dropping an egg sac or getting a breeding mode or something like that? Yeah. Wow. So there's a lot to unpack here. Um, but yes, yeah, so, no, no, I'm, I'm so glad um, that we're having this conversation. So yes, 
we do do some seasonal changing, which happens kind of naturally if you're living in North America anyway. Um, but the biggest takeaway from all of this, I think that Richard was just saying, is that there's nuance to all of this. And for some people, this can be very overwhelming. And, and you'd be like, oh, just shoulder shrug. I just want to keep them simply, you know, in my shoebox, bone dry, whatever, water dish. But there is something to be said for understanding the natural history and where they come from. Like Richard said, what, what, what was very valuable about that is that you don't want to um, capitalize on the extremes. You don't want to recreate the extremes because that's not where the animals are living, right? They might have access to slightly warmer temperatures during the day, but it cools down quite a bit at night. And I kind of and, and, and there's value in knowing that. Um, and this is where I also think that experience of other influencers that have been around for a long time or, or breeders like uh, Jess and I, this is where experience can play a role um, and why, you know, it, you there's value in listening to how people have been keeping them alive, right? But it's not black and white. So capitalizing on these changes and giving them these seasonal changes, a lot of these animals um, have evolved to, that's like a breeding season or they take time off or they molt during this season or that's when the babies like postletheria, that's why they have that extra instar, right? Because uh, when they hatch, it's very hot and dry. Um, but then they have that extra instar to get them through to the, the rainy season where food is abundant, right? So I think the biggest thing is understanding that these animals are the product of a very complex relationship, a very complex uh, environment. So while they will absolutely survive in these whole, you know, these room temperature norms with the, you know, with the shoebox and whatnot, that's not, it's, it may not be the best case scenario for where you're living to necessarily follow that guideline, right? If it's cool, like I lived in Michigan, I had to use heating appliances. I couldn't heat the room to 75 degrees or 76 degrees like to have a good baseline. So I had to rely on other tools that were kind of like passively warming those enclosures uh, to get those animals through, like I said, to the next life stage or to breed um, or to digest. So I think that the biggest thing is, is to definitely know your natural history, know where your animal's coming from because not all tarantulas are the same. Um, they're not, you know, it's not a tarantula, it's not a tarantula, it's not a tarantula. They're different species from different parts of the globe. So one thing that we like to do is we like to look at tourism photos and tourism videos that really show, sometimes they'll catch the animals on YouTube, you know, like just passively yeah. and they're behaving in their native environments. Uh, obviously going there is a huge plus, but that's not feasible for a lot of us, you know. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, just... I think the biggest thing is, is, is having an open mind and quit with the, the, the black and white, the rigid, like it has to be this. Uh, Jess and I, I'm going to tell you right now, we do not monitor humidity one bit. Because yeah. I'm going to tell you right now where a lot of these tropical animals are from, it's 80 to 90 to 100%, whether they're in the canopy or the floor, it's 100% humidity all the time. I know that because I am back at the zoo. We have data loggers that show all this information. It never changes. What changes is, you know, like the, the slight temperature, there might be slight rain adjustment, you know, from season to season, there might be slight temperature dips from season to season. Um, but the, the biggest thing, and I want to talk about this too, is, is air movement. The air moves. So we have to talk about how, um, book lungs work. It's all passive diffusion, right? Okay. So let's start yeah. with book lungs and then let's we'll start go, with book we'll move lungs. into, yeah, I think. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Yep. Yep. Cause that, I think that's where a lot of people struggle is, is, is they, 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 what do we call it? Sudden avic death syndrome or like little, yeah. everyone's kind of afraid of spiderlings, you know, and you have to think of how spiderlings are kept. Most of the time, these little tiny babies are kept in something like a vial. Vials, okay. unless you make some modification, are very sealed shut. They're very stagnant, okay, which is, which can be very dangerous for captive invertebrates because of the way their lungs work. They're called book lungs, okay, like little pages in a book. And the way they, the air exchanges is passive. It's passive diffusion. They're not forcing air in and out. It just kind of happens through the folds and the layers of those lungs, right? So if the environment is full of water vapor and there's no air exchange of the outside air, right? And the air is not moving. Well, those lungs don't work effectively. Okay, there's no passive exchange happening because it should just be happening naturally, right? It does where they're from. And it should in captivity, right? You have to kind of have to force the air to move if it's not, right? So I think that's where a lot of people yeah. struggle too with little babies is they're in, they're in a very confined space, which they do well in, but the air needs to move, right? So I think that's why a lot of people have um, don't have success with slings, you know, um, because the air needs to move. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, be right now, I'll be honest right now, Jess and I make hundreds of avicularia every, maybe even thousands every year, and we don't, we don't lose one, not one. Yeah. 
Okay. And so that's just, that's just something to think about too, is like, where are they spending their time? You know, how was the air moving there? It's, they've evolved to be like, at least arboreal animals, they're in the canopy where the air does move despite being hundred percent humidity, you know? Yeah. And so like, terrestrial animals appear to be a little more hardy because they're a little more hardy to those conditions being in the ground, you know, but they still come up at night usually. Right. And there's still an air exchange there. So. And that anyway. brings up a good point. I mean, I, I, for the most part have stopped responding to emails that are essentially like, Hey, my spider just died. What happened? Because it's okay. kind of like uh, now I have to be the detective and we have to do right. the CSI thing. So I'm like, I'm asking for photos of the enclosure, photos of the spider, yes. photos of the shelf. Then we go to photos of the room. You know, okay, like, okay. Did, you know, did somebody spray for bugs recently? Did the, yep. your great? You know, there's all different. Did you treat dogs? Like, what is it cross contamination? Yeah. It in the air? And then you do all the stuff, and and then the majority of the time, even if you're like. 90% you're never 100% sure there's not like I can't do an autopsy over no <laughs> you're, you're right yeah <laughs> uh, and I'm, I'm not a doctor or anything right. so I uh, but I think that the air like I think sometimes that that's something that I've seen a lot is that people get so obsessed with hitting these arbitrary humidity marks you're right it cut off a lot or all circulation like all the vent holes get get you know blocked up so that yep. they're hitting ninety percent humidity, which they saw on the internet, right? And then, and then the, the tarantula dies, and it's like, well, it could have suffocated. Like it, it, it could just be stagnant air for weeks and weeks, yeah, and months. They essentially, on. drown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and and a lot of times, I think, I think that's the kind of the danger. And I think I may have taken it off all of my care sheets because initially I just was started doing this. I was like, well, what are other people doing? What do other care sheets look like? Sure. And it was always like the scientific name, common name, location. Uh, temperature, humidity, yep. sizes. You know what I mean? Like that was like the basic kind of breakdown. So it was like I was filling in humidity a lot of the time just by looking at what the average humidity is in that area. Like yeah. in that, you know, well, they're from Grand Chaco or something like that. So what's the humidity there? Well, your Chaco Gold need, needs to be at this humidity. Right. Not taking into consideration the fact that they're burrowing. So maybe the temperature will be lower. The humidity could be higher. Uh, you know, there's all these different things you got to kind of take into consideration. But not even mentioning the fact that there are seasons that drastically change. But yeah, so I put that on there and then realized people were looking at that, not realizing I'm just another keeper like they are. I just happen to be typing in information out on a website or making yes. it. Yes. Yeah. And, and so it, for some reason, because they read it on the internet, it became some infallible fact. Yes. Yeah. I, it we're needs very, to be we're very mechanical. Humidity. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I have to do that or the spider is going to die. And they stressed out about it. And it's like most of your humidity gauges aren't even calibrated very well. So you yeah. think it's at 80. It could be at 100 percent, you know, and yes. it's a, or it could be at forty percent. Like they're just the cheap ones you buy. That you know what I mean. Like from the pet store that you just kind of sure. stick on the side. Like I don't yeah. know if they've ever been all that accurate. Uh, but it's like it, it. It just kind of became one of those things. Like it, it's either dry or wet. <laughs> you know, right. it's either air yeah, or, or tropical. Yes, uh, you're right. Like, I know. Just Black by, or A or B. Yeah, because it, well, it's not like I was testing the air humidity in my enclosures and being like, well, I keep them at 80%. I was like, I, these things are uh, unreliable. So I was like, well, I'm not telling you what I'm doing in that specific situation. So I'm just going to stop mentioning humidity altogether because it, yep. it doesn't seem, it seems like it's causing a lot more problems than it's helping. Yes. And that's exactly why is we're not, there's, the, okay, guys. So again, temperature humidity and air movement. They all three work together. They all play a factor in the health and welfare of your spider. So yeah, if you're going to, if you're going to keep it 90%, you're going to try to hit that number. The air has got to move. It's There has to be air exchange. And if the temperatures get cooler, the animals aren't going to do as well, right? That cold, wet, damp, stagnant air versus being warmer, like it seems to have an effect on the uh, mortality rate on the spiderlings. You know, they just seem to do better when it's warmer. In my experience, it's been over 75 degrees, you know, 75 Fahrenheit, but uh, it's not, uh, you, it's not black and white. It's not, if not A, then B. It, there's so many things going on. Again, you're trying to recreate a very complex thing. And so taking these arbitrary numbers and trying to dial in and get these things, it's, you know, it's, it's okay to be aware and be conscious of. I, that's why I always, I don't want to I don't want people to not pay attention to numbers because when you stop paying attention to numbers, that is when accidents happen. You have to know, but don't stress so much about achieving something. I just, I would just say, be aware of the captive conditions that you're exposing your animal to, but don't, don't obsess. Okay. Don't more accidents happen that way when you obsess over them. For real. Yeah. But, but still understand. um, Getting back to the complicating the cheese sandwich thing. um, Yes. So if people are 
successfully able to keep, uh, and we're just going to pick a uh, species. Well, you've talked about the Caribbean versicolor. Yep. Maybe it's not the best one, but yep. if they're able to keep this thing in a sterilite tub on just cocoa fiber, mm -hmm. what's the reason to try anything else that's more complicated? Yep. So I'm not, I never try to just like convince someone that they need to do something a certain way. Okay. But there is some certain factual information that I'm hoping influences you to try and do better for your animal. So let me, I want to circle back around to this, but real quick, animal, animal welfare is becoming a very um, hot topic. It's a topic of concern in agriculture, zoo and aquarium science. There's another one that uh, aquaculture is, is becoming quite a hot topic. Okay. And we have to be concerned about optics, the way that everyone else perceives the hobby and our, our standard of care, right? And the more animal science evolves, we understand that there's a lot more going on in these environments and how these animals interact with their environments. So what I always try to say is if it's working for you, great. Please don't tell people not to do something without knowing the parameters uh, of, of their specific environment, right? Because I see that a lot. Someone will post a picture of a lamp or a light and a tarantula is behaviorally doing exactly what it's supposed to do, trying to get warm. And people say, strip that animal of that stimulus because so-and-so on YouTube or so-and-so says it's bad. Don't do that. When clearly, like, why would you ever strip an animal of a stimulus that it's clearly responding to, right? That it clearly needs, it's doing natural behaviors, carrying out what it does. So we want to avoid that. We want to quit screaming, okay, and, and be constructive and know these parameters that Richard and I have been talking about. It's very important, okay, then just tell people to strip something unless it's blatantly dangerous, right? But a uh, heat lamp by itself isn't just dangerous, okay? It, you, you, there's more to it. So, and then what was I talking about? Oh, so it comes down to welfare. If we know more and we can do better and we, and you can try new things and watch behaviors. So like these animals, I'm telling you right now are so good at doing what they do. They're good at thermoregulating. They're good at basking. They're good at moving about their tank and expressing these behaviors. So do it, just try it. If you want to keep your Versicolor at 70 degrees and you've done so your whole life and it's fine, great. But I, I encourage you to try it. Try it. Try some. Try giving them these gradients and watch how they behave. Because I swear, we Jess and I all day long see behaviors that no one else sees. We see, we are animals. Like as soon as the lights go out, we give them a dusk period, which I think is incredibly underrated in, in a hobby. You need to give those animals that period where the sun's setting. You have to because that that's exactly they are tuned in to that time. I can count. I can't even get to thirty seconds before all my animals are out. Right. And just because they're hiding doesn't mean they're photophobic or photosensitive. That presence of light after they've either basked or whatever they had to do tells them it's time to retreat. It's time to be a spider. It's time to go hang out in my hollow for the day. And then the sun starts to set and the magic happens. Right. So it's these nuanced little things. Try it. You, you watch how your animal behaves. Don't take my word for it. Just safely try it. That's what I have to say. Yeah. Well, I can concur with you on that. The, since I moved here, uh, I've kind of, when you, Taking to take into consideration where most of the animals I keep come from. Like yep. if I were to pin them all onto a map, they all kind of, you know, whether they're snakes or geckos yeah. or frogs or tarantulas or scorpions, they're all kind of from the same belt around the globe. So they're kind of in that same area. Yes. Um, so I have set up my lights on a sunrise sunset kind of cycle. Cool. So I know what time the sun's rising. I mean, I keep it obviously because I'm working with them in, in my time zone, but I know that there's going to be today, there'll, there'll be 12.3 hours of sunlight and then the rest dark. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how I have my lights set up. So in the summer, the days are much longer and the winters cool. will be much shorter. And then right. I have staggered over two hours because I've got like six different yeah. sets of lights. So yep. they'll all be on, you know, for like the, the 12 or 13 hours or whatever it needs to be. Yep. And then one goes off. And then, you know, 20 minutes later, another one goes off. And then Perfect. Hour, another one goes off. So yeah. in the room, when like all the lights are off, I'm not here. Like it'll be really bright. But even when the light goes off on one set of enclosures, they're still kind of getting light from the other enclosures. Yes. Uh, and then, Perfect. Yeah. And then it kind of alternates. So like they, they, they all turn on, staggered. And then they all turn off in that same order. And then the next day, it's kind of backwards. <laughs> and over that cool. Day. Yeah, no, that does. I think so, that's great. Pain in the butt to set up. But in my mind, that's what kind of what I was trying to do was was simulate the rising and the setting of a sun. Yes. Uh, with At least within the room. Maybe not as effectively within an enclosure. Because if you're the one first one that comes on, it just goes from dark to light. <laughs> and that's probably... Okay. Uh, and I'm glad, let's talk about that real quick. That's where okay. that photosensitivity is coming from. So in nature... What Richard just talked about, that sudden on, sudden off, that does not happen, period, does, doesn't exist. So when you do that, go from on to off, on to off, it, you're creating a very unnatural 
uh, stimulus. So like if the lights are off and then all of a sudden, boom, the light goes on and the spider panics, well, it's now exposed, right? It was nighttime. I can do my spider things. I'm happy spider. Oh, now I'm exposed. The lights are on, right? I got to panic. I got to hide. So that's, that doesn't mean they're photosensitive. I just want to point that out really quick. That just means it's, it's responding to a very unnatural uh, stimulus. Okay. Right. Yeah. Um, but that yeah. That was something I didn't even really think about until I started focusing more on naturalistic setups. It's like, yes. I can make their entire enclosure as natural as possible, but it can even hit temperatures and humidity, but the light, uh, and I think that's something that I just learned a lot from getting into cameras and filming is what a big difference lighting can yes. do. Yes. Uh, uh, both in intensity and location and angles. And so it, it, it's, it's something that I've been I've been thinking a lot about a lot about light, and that's kind of why I was was well maybe I should be thinking about light with my tarantulas, and that's yeah. that's kind of why I was wanting to try and do this staggered thing so that yeah maybe sixth or an eighth of my collection will suddenly go from dark to light, but everybody else on that day will slowly be brightening up. Yes. And, and until the light's on in there. And well, closed. indirect yeah. ambient lighting, like you're trying to achieve. I mean, there's still a level of. Fo- the, the, the fo- they're still hitting the photoreceptors. So like, even if like there's some light co- turning off that are directly overhead, but still in ambient, you're still, you're still recreating that change. And it's that change that influenced the animals to change behavior. And also kind of do it with the temperature as well, though it's yes. not set up automatically, but it's like when I'm here and I'm working, you know, the, the temperature's warmer. And then when I leave, I usually lower the temperature much to like my uh, I have one guy that comes in here and works once a week, and he's like, it's so hot in here. <laughs> so while the air conditioner was broke, so I'm like, well, we just got to live with it. It's just right. hot in here. And then Ouch. now it's working. And it's like, well, I, I still keep it warmer during the day and then, you know, let it cool off at night. And it's not like a huge swing, you know. Sure. We're talking like 75 down to like 70 or 68. Or yeah. Something. But I want to I want to comment like to an ectotherm, that five, that's a big deal. Five, five, five degrees Fahrenheit from day to night or just from like A to B and within like a 12 inch, sp- that, that's a lot. And you'll see the spiders absolutely react to that, whether it's the lights are turning off or the lights are turning on or that's their gradient. Yeah. You know what I mean? Big right. deal. Even though it's just five degrees to us, who cares? To them, that's yeah. huge. That's everything. I sure. mean, we say that, but also if I'm sitting at my house and I'm watching TV, like I can feel the difference between the AC <laughs> set at 72 and the AC set at 71. You sometimes, know what I mean? Yeah. Sometimes that's the difference between like good sleep and bad sleep too. Yeah. You know, like I look at my, yeah. wife, my wife, like it's one degree. Like we can afford it. Just turn yeah. it up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah for sure. I am right over the line to uncomfortable right now. Like I'm just a little too warm. Like, what I do you like it at? What's your temp? What temperature do you like? What's comfortable? Yep, seventy-one is my ideal. That, that's a jam. Yeah, it used to be sixty-eight, but I think yeah. after I uh, lived in Florida for a while, I moved back up. Ah. It's like, yeah, I don't want anything that cold. Yeah, yeah, you so can. Florida is like the one place where it's people keep it colder inside during the summer than it ever gets outside in the winter. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> and then I think also it's going from heating an apartment or cooling an apartment to cooling. Yes. House. Yeah. The price difference. It's like, there's a factor there. Yep. My comfort's not that <laughs> important. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But that, that brings up a good point too, right? Like to me, I'm comfortable at 79. Anything below 79, I'm like, I'm cold. I got a, I got a sweatshirt on. You know what I mean? In sweat. Right. Well, that's just my point is like, see how, sub- see how subjective that is. Yeah. You know? It's 75 so. in here right now and I'm sweating. I, I turned the AC off to, <laughs> to record the podcast. So it wasn't yeah. blasting the <laughs> I'm actually getting pretty toasty myself. It's probably like 84 in here right now. So yeah. Yeah. And then when you get like the fancy lights and everything, those start adding some heat. Oh, yeah. 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 LEDs, <laughs> yeah LEDs, so. LEDs get warm, people. Yeah, oh. they're not just – LEDs get hot. So Yeah. Like the one I was showing you back here behind me, that that expensive one. It's like yep. a 300 watt or 300. Oh, 300 my God. Count. Yeah. But I put that thing on 100% after about a half hour. Like it's got a little fan that's going. But if I touch okay. that back exhaust, I'll burn myself. And that 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 actually is a good segue into my question. Uh, but, oh, but before I ask the question, I did want to just kind of reiterate uh, that I, I, I don't disagree with you about mm-hmm. that aspect. Because I have seen uh, since setting them up in kind of a, a more, uh, just a, that kind of light cycle, that dineural kind of th- like where they have. Uh, it's a slightly changing days and night cycle. Yes. Their behavior has, has been, and it's the same thing I said, like when I switched everybody from just a basic box to more naturalistic setups, even if I didn't really put that much money into it, just did sure. things like add leaves and add branches and add more places to hide and moss and things to kind of recreate 
that they did, they seem to be out and active a lot more, uh, a lot yeah. less stressed out. They probably feel um, safer. Yeah. Yeah. That's something I tell people with OBTs all the time. Like my OBT is so mean. I'm like, well, mine is, is fairly calm, but I have yeah. so many places for it to hide. Like it could be exactly. anywhere in its enclosure and there is a hide it can dive into within an inch. You know? yep. it's, yep. So it's you don't it. see those defensive behaviors. Yeah. It's yeah. just, it's webbed whole burrow. I mean, there's probably 20 different little tunnels to get in there. So that guy, he's got a, a labyrinth going and he yeah. doesn't give me a throw. I mean, I don't, I really got to upset him. I got to be like trying to rehouse right. him, open him repeatedly yeah. for him to turn around and give me a thread pose. I believe it. Yeah. So yeah, or put him on the table to film him. Then it's all, that's all he does. So, yeah, all bets are off, dude. Yeah. <laughs> and weird things coming at me. Yep, <laughs> yep, you took him out. <laughs> He's like, nope. <laughs> but yep. yeah, I think I think that the, there is something to it. And I, I know just the pushback I got from, like I put that video out earlier this year about... You know, I kind of made the commitment to be switching everybody over to more naturalistic or bioactive enclosures and yeah. get away from what you were just talking And it's something that I fell into initially. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of it's peer pressure. Yep. You kind of throw common sense out the window. You throw out a lot of stuff you learned about biology in school and how animals thermoregulate and stuff like that because yeah. the wide majority of people that keep tarantulas are telling you this is how we do it. Yep. Anything else is either wrong or unnecessary or deadly. Correct. Uh, and so just the pushback I got from saying, I want to switch everybody. Be People are like, that guy's an idiot. Why is he doing yeah. that? He's wasting money. He's wasting time. He's putting his tarantulas at risk. Yep. Uh, and, and it's like, I, it's hard to kind of convince people. Like I'm using my own anecdotal evidence. I'm saying I did this to these specimens. They are behaving a lot better than the ones in more basic enclosures. And the more I switch, the more I'm seeing the same kind of situation. So sure. I understand the pushback from, and, I, and I'm not, knocking you i'm not saying it's all breeders fault mm-hmm. but it's it's kind of it, your situation is weird all right yeah like, I think very that from a commercial standpoint somebody that's selling spiders would much rather you take your disposable income and send it to them to get new species than to send it to somebody that's making more elaborate enclosures or making lights or making fancy you know what i mean like, yeah oh yeah they want but, they want your money they don't want to sure. go into these supplies they want to go into animals so they're yes. and this might be like crazy podcast conspiracy theory richard but in my mind that's that's part of the reason they're pushing the simpler setups is because they know 100% you'll buy more tarantulas at $100 a spot uh, a pop if you know that you can get them an enclosure for under five bucks yep. as opposed to like a snake where it's like, well, yeah, I could buy this snake for a hundred bucks, but I'm going to be dropping $400 on all the enclosures and lights and everything that it needs. Yeah. So, you know, there's, you, you could, they, they factor that enclosure cost and husband across into the price of the animal. So that hundred dollar snake is now like a $600 snake. Yep. Now a hundred dollar tarantula is a $105 tarantula. So it seems like a much better deal. So that's that's in my conspiracy field filled mind. That's why that particular <laughs> people like you are pushing that type of husbandry because uh-huh. uh, you see it also in the reptile community for different reasons. Uh, but it's like you, you got ball python breeders. They mm-hmm. because they're breeding, they have a high capacity of animals, and they, and they need something that's quick and easy and efficient, and also you know good for the husbandry. They use like the rack system, so everybody yep. heated. That works great. It's a lot of science personal, coming in behind that one too. Just that, yeah. we can talk about that later. But yeah, there's a lot <laughs> coming at that. Oh, yeah. I don't know if I <laughs> want to get into that. <laughs> That's okay. But I just know from my own conversations and, and experience that maybe rack systems aren't the best for somebody like me. Mm-hmm. Like I'm not breeding, I'm not selling. I don't need to carry a whole lot of stock. I have a ball python. I'm going to put it in the biggest possible enclosure that I can to give it its best life and make it naturalistic and bioactive and yes. and all this kind of stuff. And and you see in the reptile community, there's a lot of businesses like custom reptile habitats and yeah, you know, uh, and then of course Zilla and Zoomed and Exoterra and all them that make these big fancy enclosures for these animals. Uh, and and because people are like, well, this is the best husbandry is to put a king snake in a four by two by two. Mm-hmm. Then they look at the breeders keeping it in like a 20 gallon tub or something. And don't quote me on that. I don't know if that's what people, I don't know anything about reptile breeding. I just know it's a tub. I don't know what science it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Snake, so I'm not accusing anybody of anything. It's just an uh, example coming out of my butt. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they put it into a tub and they put it in a rack mm-hmm. system and they don't really see it. And it's kind of trapped in there. Sure. Uh, and they're like, well, that's bad husbandry. You're mistreating your animals. And they're like, whoa, 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 whoa. No, we're not mistreating them. Like you're mistreating them because you're stressing them out, putting them in an enclosure that's too big. And like, that's the big beef that I see going on in the reptile community where sure. the breeders are, they seem to be more uh, supporting or encouraging rack systems. And then you've got 
the people that keep them as pets and maybe make enclosures being like, that's good for what they do, but for what you're doing, it needs to be a much more elaborate setup to give them their best possible life and for you to enjoy the animal as well as the animal enjoy its life. Sure. It's you're doing the exact ahead. opposite. Correct. You are uh, somebody that has a business selling animals and you are saying, don't go with the cheapest, easiest mm, uh, husbandry situation. Correct. You're actually encouraging people to kind of go the other way. Correct. Yeah, I am. Yeah. And, and you know, guys, again, this all comes back to welfare and behavior, right? So I, I'm not a good, I'm not a businessman. I'm not, a, I'm not, I wouldn't consider a great, I'm not a great businessman. Our business is growing. Uh, thank you. But, okay. you know, at the same time, um, I, I put the animal welfare first, you know, I, I'll be honest, I don't even sell, I don't, or I don't even use, like if you go in my room, it's all large glass exoteras for our breeders. And then the babies were just kind of graduating. We'll use our purple box line to get them up there. You know, we use LEDs to heat and light everything, you know, but. Yeah. So what exactly is it that you have against making money? <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> that was a joke. I need to make money. Please send me your money. <laughs> uh, but I have, I gotta be honest, man. And I, I want, I want, I want to see a shift in the reptile and amphibian and, you know, invertebrate exotic exotic animal industry i think that it's going to come to a head here soon we have to worry about optics um ultimately you know animal care and animal husbandry is going to be at the forefront you know the the uh, pet trade is is not an exception to that um and it's i, I want to comment on that too like it's really cool and really exciting to see all the neat stuff that a normal hobbyists like myself can like now make in their garages, you know, is improve husbandry and, you know, animal science is kind of tackling, you know, the, the snake rack thing. And, and, you know, and I don't want to say there's one way to do things because there's not absolutely not like you can put your animal in a shoebox and it'll be fine and it'll breed. I know plenty of breeders that do that. You know, but I think we should really inspire the conversation of of welfare and and really watching those behaviors and how it compares to what they do in, in the wild. Because in that regard, the the pet industry is behind. We are behind about 30, 20 years behind. Because um, when you look at AZA and other you know zoo aquarium sciences and all that, they're they're moving on. Right. And, and they're quantifying these things on paper, uh, which that's got its problems in and of itself. But I just think it's coming. And I think okay. it, it really doesn't do anyone any good to be like bare bones substrate or, 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 or full bioactive only. That's not I just think we just need to have these conversations. And I think at the end of the day, the animals benefit more than anyone. And I'm just going to keep running my business that way, whether it fails or not. I don't know. I mean, we'll see. <laughs> we're still we're still moving up and you know, we're doing some cool stuff. But cool. at the end of the day, I think, you know, the animals are what matter. Yeah, I mean, this is the weird thing, man. Like I, I, I care about my animals. I try to yes. give them the best possible life that I can. Yes. And I really, I need to make money as well. And yep. the way I do that is by making videos. And I have not put out a video in a minute because I have been so like, it's just every, it seems that every day there's an issue and I am dealing with been an there. egg sack or uh, I just had a black widow egg sack hatch uh, about a week earlier than I anticipated came into black widows all over the place. So I spent hours collecting them and like, yeah, I want free range black widows in here. <laughs> so <laughs> they like crawled out there, dude. the holes. Like, Oh my God. What are these? <laughs> so, I know, dude. <laughs> yeah, so it was like, that was a filming day that it just got shot. Cause now yeah. I have a hundred babies that I need to, you know, house and feed and, and figure yeah. out what to do with <laughs> and uh, speak of the devil. Did you find one? I think I just found one. To- oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> People watching. I'm like, what in the world? A little, I don't know. You can't. See I it. can't see it now. Yeah. It's a. My camera's like. I'm not gonna focus on that. Yeah. That what is, do you? It is a there. little tiny black widow. Let me oh, go pour boy. an Adeli cup real quick. <laughs> yeah. <I> lose her. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad this is happening to someone else other than me because this is something. This is something that would happen to me all day. I was just saying things come up and you get busy and you make some compromises that maybe you don't want to, but like yeah. happens, you know. Yeah. But I guess what I, the point I was getting to is. I, I do what I do based on my own uh, ideas and beliefs and, and I don't want to say ethics and morals, but you know, sure. like I, I don't want to mistreat them. And I, a lot of ways I kind of feel like they are kind of like coworkers now. You know? Yeah. Like, like yeah. I, I gotta, I have to work with them. And if I want them to perform well, I need to give them the best possible life. And then I also going to see like any money that I make, it's kind of like they made that money too. So I can sure. share it with them <laughs> as crazy as that may sound. But like, I'm, no, I'm glad you're saying this because there's a, there's a, a large population. I don't want to say large, but there's a sector of people who are like, oh, I would never like do that to my animals. I wouldn't expose them to, you know, the harassment and blah, blah, blah. But you and I have talked about that quite a bit. And 
really, it was really neat sitting next to your table because what you're doing is you are in like beings are not perfect. Humans are not perfect. Right. And so what Richard's doing, people are seeing that and it's inspiring them to get into the hobby. It's inspiring them to do their research. You know, whether you agree with, you know, getting the animals out and, and video videotaping them for the sake of money, as you want to put it, you know, I mean, Richard's fully aware of that. I'm aware of what I'm doing. Um, and I have my reasons for what we're doing, you know, but like, as long as we're morally aware of what we're doing, you know, it's, it really is helping people. And making a difference, you know, and Richard, I think you, you explained to me your process of like, sometimes animals I'll just film for hours, they won't move. And I, yeah. there's nothing I can do. So then I'll, I'll roll in some B uh, footage or whatever you call it of something else, you know, to yeah. like make that content <laughs> happen, you know, and yeah, there's a lot more going on, you know, I, yeah. I, 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 for me to your listeners, some of, some of them, I want to be, just settle down a little bit. You know, like I have a feeling that people listening to this podcast aren't the same people that aren't the same people that okay. way. But okay, maybe I don't. Yeah, knows. but I mean, really, what it comes down to, I mean, like I, I was filming them some today, I, all day yesterday, I was filming, and mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it's going to be a 10, 12 minute video, and people sure. don't realize. Oh, I spent. I'm going to end up spending probably three or four days just filming tarantulas, like coming in right. at nine o'clock, 10 o'clock in the morning, depending on how lazy I am and yeah, how long yeah. I sit and watch cartoons with a little girl before taking yeah. her to school <laughs> or to daycare. Uh, yeah. It's a whole day sometimes, multiple days, like just to get enough footage for sure. a minute video because they don't move. And I'm not one of those guys that's like handling them a whole bunch and trying mm -hmm. to freak them out, stuff like that. Like I usually, I, I will cup them up from their enclosure. I'll set them on the set kind of give them a few minutes to adjust to the lighting and they just be in, in a much larger environment. You know, they're out in, in the open. They sure. really don't have the confines and, and just kind of let them chill and just kind of keep an eye on them for 10, 15 minutes until they start, you know, you can just, you can see the spider almost like unstressed, you know, if that's yeah. Like, yep. relax. That's yeah, I'm going to be okay. Yeah. And it's all kind of huddled up and then it's like, oh wait, there's nothing trying to kill me. And they kind of spread out a little bit and then they might start, you know, slowly webbing and kind of walking around and then I hit record and, and start filming. And I usually have two or three cameras recording. So I have multiple angles, right? right so right. one action actually equals three different Clips gotcha. that I can use okay. Them. Does that make nope. sense? Yes. So, yes yeah, it, it, yeah. Yeah. So I may film them for a total of 30 hours and I may get five minutes of usable footage, but gotcha. I got that five minutes from three different angles. So I, it kind of looks like completely different footage. So it's, it's a cheat. Yeah. Um, and some, some spiders, it's not it. Like some of them will just immediately just, they're just curious and they're these they're relaxed and they're just walking around and, I get half an hour and I got more footage than I could ever use, you know, That's but cool. and then I got some tips and tricks on, on how I get them to slow down or, or speed up. And then a lot of sure. that has to do with temperature, uh, sure. how I what temperature, I keep the room, you know, the warmer it is, it seems to be the more active they are, uh, yep. but also the, sometimes the more defensive yep. uh, and the cooler it is, the slower moving they are. So, you gotcha. know, I, I kind of, I kind of adjust the temperature depending on what I'm needing from them. Gotcha. Uh, and, but that, I don't think that makes that big of a difference. At any rate, uh, I kind of got way off track there. Dude, welcome to uh, talking to me. But yeah, man, I, it, I just want to say it's really cool watching people come up to you and be like, oh man, you inspired me to get my first spider. And oh man, I made this change, this other change, you know, because now I'm seeing the other side of it where before I just wanted to like sit you down and like look you in the eye and be like, listen to me, you know, but I get <laughs> after having uh, these conversations, it's like I've really been paying attention to how people really respond to what you're doing. And, and uh, it's neat. Because without well, that, that was maybe, definitely the vibe I got from you. Like this dude is upset with me and wants to. <laughs> kind of, yeah, and then like, but I completely like just from jump. Like the yep. first thing you said, I was like, I totally understand where he's coming from. And if yep. I if the situations were reversed, I would be equally as frustrated because. Yeah. And I tell people because they come up and they tell me the same thing. Like, mm -hmm. well, in your video, you said this, and then I bought this spider from this guy, and he told me to keep it this way. And I yep. said, No, I'm going to do what Richard says. And I'm like, Whoa, whoa, whoa! <laughs> like, yeah. That of the two of us, that guy is more of an expert on that particular species, especially the specific specimen that you got mm -hmm, than I am. Mm -hmm. You should probably yeah. listen to him. Well, you I know? think there's some there's there's absolutely something to be said, you know. And I think these conversations are, they help a lot of people. They they absolutely will help people, you know. And ultimately, what I want to encourage people is take all of it in. Take what all of these influencers, these breeders, whatever they're saying, take it all in. But do your own research and ultimately look at your situation, look at where the animal comes from and say, okay, how can I meet these parameters? You know? Yeah. So I tell people all the time is one content creator 
telling you how to, t- I mean, I don't care who it is. One person is not a, is never going to be a good source for your, right. your animal husbandry. I agree. If you do everything that they say they do. And, and I mean, I may, I have like 400 videos and I have yet to give out every specific detail of how I keep my spiders just because you yeah, probably never will. Enough time. Yeah. Or it's something that's so subtle and so mundane and something that I do, you know, almost instinctually. I don't even right. think about it as a detail. So I guess my, my saying is I, there's not one single content creator, uh, at least with tarantulas, but I'm sure it applies to many, that is a is a is the perfect, amazing source for Karen right. husbandry. Right. Like they're all individually kind of crap, myself included. But the culmination of all of that experience and all of that information and all of you know, just just the just different kind of viewpoints and opinions and stuff. That is one amazing care guy. I agree with you, one hundred percent. Yeah, like you can look at my videos. You can look at Cat's videos. You can look yep. at somebody from twenty years ago, and and somebody just started yesterday, and take all of that information collectively and, mm-hmm. and apply it to your situation. You're going to have much better luck than just taking my advice. Yeah, I agree, one hundred percent, man. Yeah. So I understood where you were coming from because I know there's probably a lot of people that do what you do that kind of feel, and I've had other dealers telling me that like. It's so frustrating. Everybody, they talk about you or they talk about this other creator and that's mm-hmm. how they do it because they like you and yep. you seem successful. And it's like, yeah, but I can also tell you that it's it's YouTube, it's social media. You post your successes. Very rarely are people posting pictures of getting a divorce or sure. <laughs> a family member dying at the, you know, they're not taking selfies at the funeral yeah. or when they had a big fight with their wife or something like that's yes. not the stuff that gets showed on social Correct. media. And it's the same when it comes to animals, like very rarely, I mean, nobody's out there showing a hundred percent of their fails, you know, they, yeah. they might mention it. They might be like, well, this happens. So now this is what I do. You know, yep. and they'll focus on the positive because nobody, you know, I mean, it just, nobody wants to be like, Hey, I made a mistake or Hey, I did something wrong. And that, that's uncomfortable. And, and yeah, you know, human nature I, not to do that. So yeah, I, you, I'm you glad you said that. Yeah. I agree, dude. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. I, I've made them, I've made, we haven't had too many failures, but I, I have had, I lost uh, one of my female Metallica at one time. Cause I, I did keep them a little too warm and I did, mm. I was t- t- taking them through the dry season and I had, I did have her necropsy and she was impacted, you know, which comes from these dry conditions, you know, and I learned a lot there. Like, okay. Yeah. You know, I caught her at the water dish, you know? So, yeah. you know, cause I do, I do the, I do these cycles, you know, and it's like, all right, well, you know, I'm always telling people to do these sort of things, but here I am. I overdid it. Right. Yeah. So um, that, was, that was a huge learning curve for me. I understood where you're coming from. I think that's why I was receptive to whatever you had to say. So I'm I, so glad. I completely that, understand. That was a huge relief. I, I was like, this dude's going to punch me. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> yeah, I think that, that that's sometimes how people perceive you turns into who you are, if that makes yep. sense. And, and mm-hmm. other people's perceptions. Oh, yeah. so it's like if somebody's like, well, this guy is the goat or the know-it-all or, you know, the number one, you know, and I'm not talking about myself, but, you know, the, the, like this creator it's who I get all of my information from. They're always right. And then that, that turns into, and then everybody else must be wrong. And it's Correct. like, no, that's, it's, yeah. many people can be right. <laughs> yes. You know? I mean, there's definitely some people that are wrong, but you yep. know, there's differences in opinions and, and subtle differences. I don't think is like, I remember seeing somebody, and I think I told you about this. They posted, I don't, and I, don't I don't think it was you. I think it was, I don't remember who it was, but it was just somebody randomly had this theory of keeping avicularias in those like glass exoterra or zoomed arboreal enclosures Mm-hmm. but not putting any substrate in it at all, just filling it up with a couple inches of water. I've seen that. And they were having success, but they were just getting destroyed and roasted. On Like your tarantula is going to drown. Like there's mm-hmm. all these uh, all these issues. And it's like, uh, and I'm looking at it like that is 100% different. You know, that that's not typical behavior. Like this guy kind of took a chance posting mm-hmm. this publicly mm-hmm. and he's getting the blowback that I would have anticipated. But when you thought about it, or when I thought about it logically, it kind of was like, that kind of makes sense. My AVIX are never on the ground. A lot of AVIX are found huge, over water. Yeah. yeah. And I have a huge water bowl in there. Really, it wouldn't be that, like the water bowl's taking up a third of the ground surface. Yeah. Maybe this guy's on to something. I never tried it, but I kind of wanted to. And mm-hmm. then I was like, I'm going to make a video about it. And then I was like, well, that's just kind of stealing this dude's idea. He might, and I don't remember who it is to ask, but maybe one day I'll, I'll try it out. But, yeah, I can't remember the name. I've seen that too. And mm-hmm. it just is one of those instances of like, that's not a bad idea. Like it, maybe it's not going to work, but it doesn't mean we should just shoot it down before anybody ever tries to mm-hmm. do any research and see what, Agreed. you know what I mean? Like logically, That's what I'm talking about. Sense. Yeah. But quit, that, quit firing right away. Like instinctively, you know, there's, yeah. there's nuance guys, you know. So when you first started talking about your husbandry mm-hmm. uh, and, and your kind of theories and ideas, 
my initial reaction, probably just like everybody else, was like, well, this guy's an idiot. He obviously doesn't know what he's oh, talking yeah. about. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. he's trying to sell me something. Like, that was my big thing. <laughs> I've like, heard that a lot, too. Like and he, I, like he, I said, I don't... He's selling these lights, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Or heating elements or lights or cages. I'm right. Like, I don't... Buy them or don't. I don't care, you know, but right. um, I, I do care. But the point like, is... The more I watched, the more I was like, well, he's not an idiot. He has a background in, in animal husbandry. He's working. Sure. Like maybe, maybe just because it's not what I was taught, I shouldn't shut it down immediately. And that I'm was the cool thing about talking man. with you, especially at yes. the show. You know, it was like really kind of getting to know more about your background and, and why I was excited to have you on the podcast and, and yeah, thank you, man. You know, work, with, uh, work with you in the future and stuff. Just because I was like, well, he's yeah. a good guy. He knows what he's talking about. He cares about the animals. We have a lot more in common than what I ever expected. You know, yeah. just, just talking to you, which is great. You know, I think <laughs> more of that, guys. Yeah. You know, I think if, if a lot of people met Richard, they'd be, they'd be surprised at who, who he really is and how he listens and takes the time to think about, you know, things before he speaks and all that good stuff. It was awesome, man. I'm really glad you finally decided to uh, have me on and let's talk. You know, I, you're making awesome. me very curious. I kind of want to like get in onto your social media and see what oh, your algorithms like because I feel like your feed is filled with people that hate me. <laughs> no, no, I, I I don't participate. I'm don't message me. No one message me. I'm not good at communicating. I won't do it. Don't take it personally. I don't communicate in the groups. I don't do any of that. But um, no, I just, I, I know the other side, you know what I mean? And I, I I know the other perspectives and I used to be on that other side, not necessarily with a group of individuals. I just had my own views and opinions and I just wanted so badly to just have a sit down and like, let's talk about factual science first and then talk about husbandry, you know, and like, let's make these changes. But, you know, I, I, I just, I know where other people are coming from and it, being on that other side, it was really nice to sit down and chat with you. And, and, and I had to catch myself and put my shoe in my mouth and be like, there's a little more going on guys. It's, it's not black and white. There's nuance to everything. So yeah. That's one, one really good thing I took away from our, our meeting, you know, so. And I hope anybody listening to this podcast, that's one thing they take away is, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> there's a huge gray area and it's, it's very, it's those very slivers of the extremes that are black and white. You right. Know, there's You're right. a few things that you definitely always have to do and a few things you definitely should never do, but then everything else is kind of like, well, it depends on your situation. It depends on the specimen. It depends on yeah. the enclosure. Like there's a lot of stuff, a lot of variables that goes into this stuff. And yeah. it could, and, and two people keep the same species in the same exact conditions, but with different husbandry and both be successful. Yes. You know, it's like, that's possible as well. Like it's, it's not yes. a uh, right or wrong, uh, you know, what, what, it's not a team thing. Kind of team sport, I guess. Uh, but I, I've noticed like haters really bothered me when I first mm -hmm. started. Like, because yeah. I didn't have any for a while. It was just like, sure. it just seemed like first thousand, maybe 10,000. It was like all fans. Like, yeah. like, oh, I love what you're doing. This is amazing. It's all positive feedback. And then somewhere around there, there was this, this shift where it was like, it's like, a, it's a scale. You become too successful. Then the people that loved you don't love you anymore. They're like, oh, mm. you fell out. Or, you know, you ran a, you had a commercial for this business. And so now I don't like you. I don't trust you. Interesting. Anymore. Hmm. You're spending too much time on the cinematography and not enough time talking about facts or hey, there's all, and then like all the negative feedbacks are, and it's like, I see. Hates me. even though the views are going up and the money's going I've up. I've seen the people meet you in up. person, man. Yeah. People love you, <laughs> you know? So, and I, so I'm weird. still hearing your name all the time. So, but, but that I, was the I, thing I, is I started going in public and I'm like, none of these haters are talking. I mean, some of them right. have come up and talked to me, but they've been really nice and, yep. and, very complimentary. It's like, oh, this is just an internet thing. And then somebody was like, those that can't create, criticize. So mm. that's like when I read one of those, I'm like, oh, you, you're, you're criticizing. And it means you can't. And usually if you say like, well, make a video and show me how to do it right. And they're like, oh, no, I don't know how to do that. And it's like, well, then shut up. <laughs> like, Dude, but I'm one, of, the, I'm one of, of those people. I told you, I'm like, I can't do what you do. And that's why I want to sit down and talk to you because what you do is, is so you're very talented, but I you know, I wanted the information to be slightly different, but I was one of those people too. I was just like, I'm envious that this dude can do this, you know, yeah. and make it look so nice and people respond the way they do, you know? So uh, I, I get it all, man. I think we all just need to take, on the take a step back. Like, he was like, the only reason you have any followers is because you spend all that money on fancy camera equipment. Mm. Like, for one, all my camera equipment is kind of like the cheaper end of what I could, like when we were talking cameras, sure. you're spending, you can be spending tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars on lenses and rigs and, and camera bodies. And like, I have always gone for the, what is the best bang for the buck? You know what I yeah. mean? Like that's, yeah. that's like, I'm going to spend the least amount of money to get the biggest return on investment. And that's, yeah. the, that's where I go. Sometimes I buy stuff that I end up never, I use it once and then like, oh, well, that was a cool shot. And then I don't use it again. <laughs> I'll be like, you need to yeah. use that again to yeah. justify the expense or sell it or something. But yeah, I, my whole point was, I didn't get that 
stuff until I had the money coming in, like until I had the success. You know, you start on your iPhone. Yeah, or no, I don't use freaking Apple products. Okay, oh, there it is. I don't know. (laughs) I use it on a Galaxy. Yeah, (laughs) of course. Yeah. Okay. Okay. (laughs) Stupid me. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know how Uh, it works. So yeah, I I, I, and I was like, that's the first hundred videos are just all cell phone. (laughs) <laughs> and yeah. so it's a lot more. It's a lot to do with lighting. It's a lot to do with editing and, and yeah, man. stuff like that. There's a lot to go into it. People appreciate it when they're watching it, but they don't, it never registers. It's like, oh, that was an effort. Like, right. like it just naturally happens. Like, yeah. Well, that was a cool thumbnail. You just took a screenshot from the video. It's like, no, I spent a day designing that. <laughs> I believe it, man. Yeah. We try, we try to do a couple and I just immediately that. Before I even talked to you, I was like, okay, <laughs> there's a yeah. lot more to this than what I thought. It's so, frustrating. And yeah. so that's, I just kind of take that. Those that can't create, criticize. And yep. there was another one that was, uh, it was like a reel. It was one of those cheesy affirmation reels. But it was like, uh, I love my haters because it doesn't matter how much they talk about me. They're still watching my content, which means they're fans. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh. so there's people that are hating. Every time I put a video out, they're making posts about how terrible I am. Like, I forgot. They watched it and now they're promoting it. And they're and even though they're like complaining and saying I'm an idiot, mm-hmm. people are like, ooh, I want to in on the drama and they're going over and watching it. And oh, yeah. Most people have critical thinking abilities and they, they read something and they're like, ooh, I want to see what this drama is about. And they watch it and like, oh, that's not what he said at all. all and, right. You know I what I mean? Wow, this is a lot, lot better production value than some of this other people that I like. And, right. and so then it just helps grow the channel. So now I'm like, hate me. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> yep. But, I'm going to keep I'm going to keep going. You so those I mean? are the type yeah. of haters that I don't like. Uh, right. The type of haters that that I feel bad about and I worry about are people like you that are not saying that you're a hater, but just no. some like you had an impression of me based on what other people had said and and kind of this like generalized idea of who I am. Mm-hmm. And I'm surprised that you know what it's like. Well, I was I was I didn't like the information the pack the information. I liked the way you packaged yeah. and delivered everything, but I was like, we I want to focus. And this is not you. You were just repeating on what you said heard from 20 years ago, right? Like, this is just how yeah. you do it, right? Right. So that that was my take on it was like, I want to sit this dude down and I want to talk to him about factual science because I'm not hearing it. And not just from you, from from all of you guys, you know, uh, the uh, cat and so and so. I just, I want to, I want to, uh, a little bit of this influence to come from like the biological background stuff and like the animal welfare sure. stuff and the husbandry stuff. Cause, and if anyone's going to do it, I wanted, I wanted to talk to you about it, you know, because you, you yeah. it does pull people in. I see how people respond to your videos, you know, so. And what I do is a little bit different. Like, I, I, I feel bad when people compare me to tarantula cat just because, like, we're both talking about tarantulas. It's, it's different we're stuff. Two completely yeah. different types of creators. Like, 100%. she is a, like a day in the life kind of mm-hmm. vlog. Mm-hmm. it's all personality. These are my animals. These are my pets. Yep. These are my interactions with them. You know what I mean? Like it's not, it's, it's more entertaining. And I'm not saying you can't learn from cat. I'm not saying she doesn't know anything. She doesn't have anything to offer. That's not what I'm saying at mm-hmm. all. She, she's a good friend of mine. Oh yeah. I hear her name too. Yeah. yeah. From, from, uh, but it's yeah. like, that's not, she's not trying to teach people as, as much as she's just, you know, as, she's not yep. trying to teach us maybe like lead by an example. Like mm-hmm. this is what I do. And mm-hmm. it's never like, you need to do this uh, to be successful. Yeah. Correct. The same with like uh, Petco, you know, mm-hmm. like he gets a lot of hate for sometimes not having scientific information or factual. It's like, well, he's not the Encyclopedia Britannica in video form. He's a guy that's making Dude. videos about what he's doing, his interactions with his animals. I've seen his stuff and it is it is far beyond a lot of these people who are criticizing his content, like the way he keeps his animals, I would say all day long, he's got it figured out versus these people who are, who are criticizing him. You know, right. I've seen, I, I don't watch a lot of content, I don't have time, but from yeah. what I have seen, you know, yeah, it looks, it looks really good. I just, you just got to let it roll off, man. You know, I think like, because I started out doing the care videos mm-hmm. and that was mainly because that's what I was searching the most. I was like, I, I want to know how to take care of my tarantulas and I'm tired of reading these care sheets. Like I want just, I'm more of a visual learner. So I wanted to Same. see. And, uh, you know, you can tell me about enclosure, but to see it actually made uh, mm-hmm. in the process that mm-hmm. resonated a lot more with me. And, and so I wanted to, and, and essentially I was watching other guys that did that. Yes. And I was like, God, these videos are really long and boring and they're talking in circles and uh-huh. I, like, I could do this better. So that was essentially all of, like, I'm essentially going to take the exact same information because that's what yep. I use. That's what I learned. That's what yep. I'm doing, but I'm going to package it in a more digestible format. Yes. And you then, nailed it. Yeah. yeah. And so, I mean, that, that was the initial kind of genesis of plan. <laughs> Got it. Got it. Copy paste. Yeah. It worked. Okay. And then it kind of got to the point like, 
may, I don't really believe this in it. Like I've grown as a keeper over time right. and, and now I don't really believe this. And I think what was kind of the, the tipping point for me, maybe turning a little bit more towards your kind of philosophy with husbandry is sure. it was during that. And I don't want to get into it. We can do a whole podcast. I'll bring you back on. We'll talk okay. about back systems in another podcast. Sure. I feel like that's a hole that we could really spend oh, a lot yeah. of time trying to dig ourselves out of. But mm-hmm. they, there were people that were just destroying this breeder for poor husbandry because he kept his snakes in small tubs on a rack system. Sure. Right. And then like sometimes when I read people's comments and they're really kind of just like, just way, way out there, just really abusive or mean, or just, you can tell this person's really affected by this post. Yes. I'll like click on their profile and look at it. Just like, what kind of person is this? Who are they? I've done that too. Yeah. And then one post, two comments, I clicked on them. They were tarantula keepers who also had other animals, but they kept tarantulas and their tarantulas were in sterilite tubs. And I'm like, sure. how is that any different? Really? You're, you're complaining because this dude's keeping his snakes in like the barest minimal mm-hmm. type of enclosure and you're doing mm-hmm. the same thing with your spider. And Correct. that's completely acceptable in the tarantula hobby, but apparently is not acceptable in the reptile hobby. And I understand they're different species with different needs and stuff like that, but it's just on a base level. Right. Not talking about any of the husbandry or care requirements. Just right. You're doing the most basic and you're complaining that somebody else is doing the most basic. If that makes right. sense. Right. So that was kind of, I was like, well, maybe this like it did and, and i was starting to see all the uh, stuff I'm yeah healthy mentioned. mentally yeah but yeah so that that's kind of why i was i was and, and and just to be like i'm i don't even fully understand what one of your enclosures look like you know what i mean like how mm-hmm. like you talk about the, the lighting you talk about the heat lamp and, and simple and providing stuff like that yeah but even when i saw you in person i mean you had one set up uh, i i assume uh, like one of the enclosures you had designed which i uh-huh. thought was really cool but like i don't I guess what I'm trying to figure out is it, it, we're just going to go back to the heat lamp. We're gonna let's do it real quick. Yes, let's do it. Something I, I feel like is the most. Anytime I hear anybody talk about Marshall Arachnid's husbandry, that's mm-hmm. always the thing that they're like, well, he uses heat lamps. So obviously he doesn't know what he's talking about. So mm-hmm. Obviously he has thousands of spiders that are thriving. So maybe he does know what he's talking about yes. at, on some level. Like we can, can't completely discount him. So you're going to use a heat lamp on an enclosure. We'll mm-hmm. say Caribbean of Versicolor because that's what you had mentioned earlier. It's yep. in a, we'll say Exoterra 12 by 12 by 18. Does that sound yep. fair? Mm-hmm. Keep a spider Perfect. in there? Perfect. What kind of heat lamp are you using in there that's n- not going to be too powerful? Yep. So there's two options I always tell people to go with. We talked about those little ZoomEd halogens. Those work. Um, hold on. See, I, I already caught where someone's going to get me. So the, we got to talk real quick about the screens because there the Equaterras come back with the screens and, 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 and that's a bad thing in the hobby. I use them, but I don't recommend people use them, okay? Because I think there's a lot more going on with behaviors and getting caught in those screens than um, I think we really have time for. But it's not a problem for me. It never has been. And uh, we use them on our terrestrial. We, we replace the lids on our terrestrial animals, not our uh, arboreals. So that's where this is coming from. So please keep okay, that in mind. Quick point of order, just so I am, I this is just for my own clarification. Yes. You're, you are saying that in arboreal enclosures, you, just, you do use screens, but in terrestrials, you don't? That's correct. Okay. Yep. Yep. So in the arboreal animals, like I really look at them like I do arboreal lizards because they, to me, they behave the same exact way. They have similar requirements, um, avicularia in particular, because that's what we're talking about. They really like really tight beam basking spots as if kind of imagine the sun's coming through the leaves and it's hitting a very particular spot on a tree where they might make their hammock or right on the other side of the tree where they make their hammock for a very short period of uh, time uh, of day. And so that's what I try to capitalize on with my AVIX. I have like four hours where I'll use like a, uh, uh, I use track lighting. Track lighting comes in these little bullet lights that kind of screw into a track, and it's that same kind of bulb design where it's a halogen. They can okay. be dim. They can be dimmed, so you can decrease the intensity. Because remember, we talked about we're not going to put a 125 watt mercury vapor bulb on a too small of an enclosure because we will cook the spider. The spider sure. won't cook itself. I will cook the spider. So giving that control, I can set exactly, I can dial it in. For those, for my AVIX, I aim for 85 to 90 degrees basking spot. And then the ambient temperature is anywhere from 75 to 80 in the enclosure during the day and dips down to 70 to 75 at night, depending on... So I just want to make sure we're painting an accurate picture with our words here for people Correct. listening. Okay. So, so for, uh, we're, we're just going to stick with the uh, arboreal right now. You, yep, got the AVIX. Last yep. enclosure, like, yep. so 12 by 12 by 18 with a string yep. lid. Yep. And then... Now you said at first the halogen light, but now mm-hmm. now you're talking track lighting. Is, yeah. What so type the, of light bulb does that use? 
Yeah, it's the same. They're halogen. Um, I need okay. this is why I need your help to do a video on this. <laughs> I like I like halogen. Halogen anything is really nice because it's dimmable, um, it's efficient, and it creates a very tight beam. Okay, okay. so in, in 18 inches or 12 by 12 by 18 inch enclosure, it's a small space. So that means you have to think I need to recreate something small. Halogen does that because it's a very tight beam reflecting on something. In this case, cork bark is what I use, cork hollows. So close to that burrow, I give them that little beam, right? That at the top, if they want to come out, they can bask. And they usually do in the morning for like four hours, two hours, three hours. And then they disappear, right? I don't keep it on all day. Some of the postletheria, I will for part of the season. You know, I'll give them a basking pot of like 100 degrees. But anyway, the yeah. AVIX. So I have the cork hollow. My, my, my setups are very simple. I think people tend to focus on the complexity when really it comes down to like what we talked about. Temperature, moisture, uh, availability, and airflow. Mm -hmm. If you can keep a spider in something this big, but if you nail those, you're going to be successful. Okay. I'm not saying do that. I'm just saying that that's the most important thing. But yeah. you got to think small scale when you're working with 12 by 12 by 18 enclosures, right? Mm -hmm. And then alternatively, if I don't want to give them a basking site, which I usually only do for brooding females because they present their egg sacs in the direction. They literally hold them like this in the direction of the, the heat source, right? Okay. So I let those eggs warm. I let moms brood their sacs and they will do this during the day with their egg sacs, okay. right? Which makes sense. They're incubating, right? And you're just kind of like twisting your hands. Again, a lot of people are watching. Literally, <laughs> literally, yeah, I'm twisting my hands. I'm sorry. But they're literally presenting. They're like, it's like an offering to the, to right. the sun, right? They're right. like, they're holding it up and then, and then they rotate it. So it's like, gotcha. think of like a ball in their hands and they're just, they're incubating their eggs. Sure. Very typical, right? Yeah. Um, otherwise, I use LED grow lights. So uh, in the form of a strip, I use the mm -hmm. Barina brand because they're cheap. They come from China. It's real cheap. And um I like them. I use anywhere from 5,000 to 6,000 K. Uh, think full spectrum lighting. Okay. On during the day, off at night. Sure. Uh, um, and then I give them that dawn, that dusk period. And just those lights in, in particular, because they're grow lights, there's a higher wattage, like we talked about earlier. So they do get a little bit warmer. And that just gives them a gentle gradient anywhere from 10 to 15 degrees within a 12 by 12 by 18 exoterra. And again, my ambient temperatures in the room are 75 degrees Fahrenheit. They will dip a couple of degrees because, you know, the unit turns on and whatever, you know, it cool. And then it cools down at night. But 75 is ambient what I'm going for. And then in the tank, I give them 10 degrees higher than that. And then I watch them move up and down during the day or if they're going to molt or if they're after a meal or something like that. Okay. So that's where that, that's where I'm coming from. Just to that. clarify a few things. So you're yes. at your enclosure, 75 ambient room temperature. Mm -hmm. you, said you want the enclosure to be 10 degrees warmer. So is that an 85 degree ambient temperature or is that? No, I'm glad you said that. Hot spot? So, yep. So 10 degrees at the hot spot and then they can come back down to a roughly ambient room temperature. Does that yeah. make sense? So there's a, that's yeah. your baseline. And I get that from natural history. I look at what happens usually where they're, where they're spending their time. Yeah. Um, and I change that from species to species, which takes time. That's, I don't have an answer for that. That just takes time to figure out. I've been lucky enough to where I have contacts that have traveled all over the world and I'm like, Hey, what's going on? How are these yeah. animals spending their time? Do you see them? What are they doing? Yeah. Right. And I've seen a couple myself. So I, that's where that's coming from. But well, that's, that's one of those, I mean, you yeah. just kind of stumbled upon, well, I think one of the biggest issues in the mm -hmm. hobby is it, you just said it, it takes time. So mm -hmm. what you're telling people is that they need to spend time and effort and resources and, right. and that sometimes is not something people want to do. Like I agree. You're trying to tell somebody like, well, this would be the optimal care is mm -hmm. to have this temperature gradient and this type of airflow. And then they're going to look at how much, and, and the fact that it's not a definitive answer, like have the light three inches away. Uh, at this this particular wattage, it takes the critical this thought. temperature. You yeah. know what I mean? Like you're not mm -hmm. spelling it all out for them, so they're like, "Well, this guy said use a sterilite tub with cocoa fiber and uh, right." It's more fiber. appealing, right? Yeah. Soda pop, water dish. So yep. that's easy and clear. And so I think part of it is laziness, but I think also at least what I have kind of gathered uh, just from people talking mm -hmm. to me is. Mm -hmm. There's also a, a level of responsibility that is removed from the individual keeper when they 100% follow somebody else's care guide. I agree. Because then I didn't make, like, the, the keeper would be like, well, I didn't do something wrong. It must have been Richard. Oh, um, yeah. Said this on his care guide. My yeah. spider died. It wasn't anything I did. It was him. So uh -huh. I think that that is something 
someone in your particular position that's trying mm-hmm. to kind of, I don't want to say like market or encourage. Or, you know, I'm trying to encourage oh, a, a different way of thinking about the yeah. spiders themselves. Yeah. But I'm that, thinking that that's going to be the biggest hurdle for anybody 100%. that's trying to do something like you is mm-hmm. that, that you're requiring people in your description of how to do it. Yep. You're just outright saying it's going to, there's, it's going to be variable dependent on your species you're in for your, your situation. And yeah. you're going to have to use some thought and figure this out on your own to get details right. Like, I think that's Correct. what a lot of people are going to check out. <laughs> yep. Just, I know. And I, I don't want to plug myself or, or our business or anything, but that's why we're like, let's figure out how we can give them a package where the light's already there. They don't have to think about it. They just yeah. di- dial it in, you know, buy a heat gun is very simple. They're very cheap. And then it's, you don't have to think too much. Just yeah. figure out what species you're working with. And watch well, their I, behavior. Before we move on, I just I really want to kind of just make sure that this was explained uh, as well as possible. Um, sure. Because I, I'm not 100% clear, so I'm assuming that there's probably some people listening that may not be 100% clear. But okay. we're going back to the Caribbean of Versicolor Arboreal Glass Enclosure, 1824. Yes. Got the, the halogen light above it. Mm-hmm. Uh, that What is the wattage of that light? So usually they're only 20 watts. 20 watts? And yeah, about how far, in general, I know it's going to change mm-hmm. depending on mm-hmm. how you close your setup and all that. But in general, like, is it right on the screen or do you, how many inches do you kind of have? If it's Smart. Like- yeah. Good question. So yes, there is some space and it's usually anywhere from three to six inches of space between the top of the enclosure um, and the bulb itself. And that takes adjusting. I, that works for me. And again, I have a dimmer so that I can dial everything in, but that just takes simply, okay, here's a heat gun. Yeah, you know, and, and I measure and I know, okay, well, that's where I want it. You know, sure. so it just takes a little bit of time, a little and bit of dialing the, in. The LED strip lights yep. uh, oh. that you were talking about that do produce some heat, mm-hmm. are those directly on the enclosure or are, are those also off the enclosure? Either or. Yeah, usually they're right on it. They're right on because okay. they have, they kind of have a little frame and that frame mm-hmm. kind of sits on top of the Exoterra frame. Because like I said, we use Exoterra enclosures and, and so they're roughly about an inch from the surface, but they're resting on top of it. It's not a focused beam, right? It's just sure. a kind of diffused uh, source of light and heat, right? Yeah. yeah. I'm not intentionally doing what you're recommending. Sure. But kind of, I am unintentionally, I guess. <laughs> sure. the word. There was another word I was looking for. But uh, for instance, and this is something that I'm just an idiot, maybe because I'm not a huge reptile guy, I didn't completely t- uh, take into consideration and wasn't mindful of. But like I, I use the puck lights. I've been using the puck, LED puck lights. Yeah. Illuminate enclosures initially mm-hmm. just for my own viewing pleasure. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like when people come down, I turn on the lights and it would look all nice and fancy and beautiful. And I thought that was a cool way to kind of display them. But I, I started realizing over time, especially when I switched to like a day-night cycle for the lights, that those little puck lights, if they're on for more than like an hour, they start to produce some some heat. You know what yes. I mean? It's not like it's going to burn you, but it's it's definitely producing warmth. And when yes. I had that sitting on top of an enclosure, just like laying on top, especially like a, a, an acrylic enclosure, it was warming up the acrylic enough that it was raising the temperature in the enclosure because of like a, essentially the greenhouse effect. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like uh-huh. Uh, mm-hmm. And then I was I was realizing that it's 72 in my basement. This enclosure, when I throw a heat gun on the inside, it's like 78. I mean, yeah. it's not a huge difference, but it's definitely warmer in there. And then yes. I, when I started doing the bioactives and I started using like the LED grow lights, like the, the like the BioDude sells these ones that kind of screw into a regular outlet. Yep. And they're just super bright, but they have a heat sink on the back that gets extremely hot. So yes. yep. I was using that for my geckos or even something like the, the fluorescent grow lights. Yep. It's producing heat, but it's on top of the enclosure. So I would think logically that that heat would rise and just dissipate. But there is enough of that light and heat that's getting projected into the enclosure that even though it's not a heat lamp, it is still raising the temperature. Mm-hmm. And it's creating like a, a warm side. It's creating a temperature. Gear a right? gradient. Yeah. It's what, in my gecko enclosure. And I, mm-hmm. I am using like a more of a, uh, I'm also using a heat lamp in there. But when the heat lamp, I didn't even have it installed yet. Like one of those deep heat things. Deep heat yeah, you were talking about that. I have, I don't have experience, yeah. but yeah. I like those. Yeah, they sound um, cool. But yeah, so I, before I had those set up, I just noticed just the LED grow bar was was raising, was creating a temperature gradient in the enclosure where it was much cool. warmer at the top and much cooler at the bottom. And, nice. You know, so yeah, it's, it can be that simple. More. But yeah, yeah, so I guess what I'm trying to get at is that I think a lot of people maybe that are keeping their tarantulas under lights are kind of doing something already uh, mm-hmm. accidentally. Yeah, <laughs> they're, they're changing the temperature based on, you know, they're, they're, but I, I see what you're saying. I mm-hmm. see where you're coming from. Um, and, and like when we talked, it was like a, a, not a hundred percent against it. And yeah, 
I, I want to encourage people to really just watch your spiders, you know, yeah. watch, watch their behavior because they're going to do it. And if they're spending a lot of time plastered to one side or the top or something like that, th- th- they'll tell you maybe we should go a little warmer or that. Mm-hmm. I, I see this all the time, that stilting behavior yeah. where they sit tall. If they're not eating something, 100% of the time, that is thermoregulatory behavior. And they'll do usually do that in the direction of a heat source, right? So that might be an indication to you, like, okay, my, my spider's talking to me here. It's telling me yeah. something. A little warmer. Because give them a little bit, little bit warmer, something during the day, you know? Yeah. Um, and just watch them. It doesn't have to be much. Like, like Richard was just saying, a little LED bar could be. That could be it. That could yeah. be all it takes, you know, to provide them with those. And, you know, it, it really just comes down to like, you know, the animals just do better. They just do better when they have access to warmer temperatures. They, they do. They have, they have the energy they need. They can molt. They digest. They reproduce. They, they do all the bodily functions just better when they're warmer because they're, yeah. again, they're, they're ectotherms, you know. So I mean, it's, it's a hard sale, man, because I feel like a lot of the whole tarantula hobby mm-hmm. and spider hobby in general has – thrived on the kind of concept, the marketing idea that these are really cheap and inexpensive to keep as compared yep. to mammals or reptiles. You know, I know. I know yeah. that's something I have pushed a lot on people for years was like you, the, you could buy a $500 or maybe that's an exaggeration, but we'll say a day gecko may cost you a hundred bucks sure. or you could get a spiderling for 20 yep. and the day gecko's enclosure is going to be a couple of hundred more dollars and the spider's enclosure is just going to be a couple of dollars and the yes. food for the reptile is going to be, you know, maybe a couple hundred dollars a year where it's like half that or even like, cause they're only eating crickets and not mice. Right. So it was, it was the cheaper option that required less husbandry, less care, less money, uh, less attention. You know what I mean? That was just like, it was oh, the yeah. easiest and cheapest of all the exotic animals. So that's why that was, that was thriving. And, and then you're coming around being like, actually, we might be able to keep them. Maybe we should be keeping them more like reptiles. And people, I think there, there's a certain segment that's going to be like, oh, no, no way. Correct. That's not why I wanted to get into this hobby. Yep. Uh, and I've, I've learned that the hard way. That's why I quit kind of coming out being like this. Cause I was like, okay, we're dealing with a mentality and a, a psychological thing with people too, where it's like, they don't want their tarantula husbandry or spider husbandry to be anything more than just that, like a simple room temperature, you know, and the animals do survive, right? They're very resilient. They're very hardy. Then, you know, it's easy to capitalize on, on that. So I, I do understand that, you know, I think at the very least, I want people to just consider these small details and consider the, the, the non-refutable, you know, fact that they are, they are poikilotherms that by design, they, they do thermoregulate. They do take advantage of those things. So yeah. I think if you, if you just play around with those thoughts in your head, you know, you might be able to help your spider or, you know, see cooler behaviors and you know, not keep them in the closet, you know, learn right. that if you do give them full LED lighting, they do respond to them that in a natural way. The more natural we can make things, I think the better off overall it's going to be. It, yes. Uh, you know, it, I mean, even something as simple as just having some live plants, yeah. Like I, I remember when I first started doing some enclosure supply of plants, I, I think somebody even mentioned it in a podcast, but then there was also other people leaving comments and stuff that were like, that's just a waste of money. It's a waste of time. It's bad for the animal. It's, it brings in all this other stuff. The tarantula is just going to dig it up and destroy it in a couple of weeks anyways. Why are you doing that? Sure. And that same Lociodora periabana now, uh, almost two years, it's been in a bioactive enclosure with the same plants. It didn't kill That's any amazing. of them. It didn't yeah. dig them up. It didn't web them. I mean, it webbed on some of them, but it's like it incorporated it into its hide and into its environment. Like, it's, sure. it's her plant now. I'm not messing with it. It's, yeah. you know, it's probably covered in hairs, but yeah. she uses it. She doesn't, she doesn't destroy the same with like I did it with the Theraphosa Sturmy and mm-hmm. I got to go in there and cut the plant back because it's just growing too nice. well. Yeah. But it's like the spider, I see her use it all the time as far as like, I don't want to say like, she doesn't use it, like she travels through it. So it's like, sure. covered, you know what I mean? Sure. Like I, she could walk right out through the open part of the enclosure, but she seems to prefer to like kind of go through the, through the plant. Yeah. And, yeah. I get that. Cognito, and and yeah. it's just really cool to watch. And it's like, if, if I just had, uh, you know, a, a wooden Buddha in there or just, right. you know, something, some cool decoration that made it look neat. Right. It wouldn't kind of get that natural behavior of like that exploring kind of, mm-hmm. I don't even know how to describe it. I'm going to just film it. <laughs> there you like, go. Yeah. I mean, kind I, of the same I, type I of behavior I try to get in the documentaries of just like the, there's the natural kind of, you know, walking around type of behavior. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man. Plants, I mean, l- let's be real. I have some Zenestis that tear all the plants up that I give them. So it's, it's, it's almost like, why bother? You know what I mean? Some right. Zenestis and some Pamphlobedias, they just like, they, they, it seems to be enriching for them to uproot and, chew the plants 
whatever. That's cool. Whatever. Yeah. But you know, plants, you know, the, the, it's more than just that. The, you know, you get different, you can, uh, f- different services for them to drink off of, you know, cause you know, as water is a sensory cue for them, right? So fresh, fresh mist, a lot of these animals, that's, that's like a daily thing for them. So that's even though they have a water dish, right. Uh, fresh mist gives them something to, to do. It's like a sensory cue. Oh, I'm going to go drink, right. Uh, yeah. I'm thirsty. Right. So drinking off of foliage is very natural. Like you said, giving them more hide structure, root ball structure, uh, to play with you know all these little things is it necessary no we know it's not but the animals seem to there's something there they utilize that right they have that in nature so Mm -hmm. um i i love it i think it's a great it brings more to it right it brings more to keeping just the spider in a shoebox to me and seeing the animals interact with them which they do is is cool and it grows with them it grows with this but the with the tank it grows with the spider right yeah it's you know there's a learning curve there like, right. you know, let's not just say everyone's going to be successful keeping plants. I still have plants that die. <laughs> just, you know what I mean? Like, is it, I, yeah. or they'll die. And then, you know, like, cause we just moved to a very humid environment. Now that all that foliage died, now they're starting to come back. Yeah. It's a learning curve. It's, but it, it, it's not just like, oh, well it died. So forget it. Screw it. No one, no one should do that. Yeah. And I'm not a arbor. I'm not arborist. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, yeah. a, uh, whatever the word is for people that work with plants. Botanist. There Botanist. we go. Yeah. 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 Uh, or you know, anything like that. Like I, I, I am not, I, not at there's all. one plant I could grow really well in my twenties and I haven't grown it in many, many years. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but there's the basic light and, and water that's needed to keep a pothos alive in an enclosure cannot right. be harmful to a tarantula. I guess it's kind right. of my philosophy. Like I got to yeah. water it and I got to have enough light for a pothos to survive. Mm-hmm. That, I feel like that's only going to help the tarantula. It's going to help simulate more of a natural environment as far as yes. light cycles and, and and humidity but you know it's like it's like it's not that it's not groundbreaking controversial it's not something you should freak out about no and it's a pothos so like you, clippings are free <laughs> just, correct they eat it or they destroy it they tear it up i'll just pull it out and yeah. maybe plant another one maybe not we'll see what but for the white um, the wide majority of my animals all seem to like to use utilize and they use them. interact with yeah. the light, light plants and, I and agree. I'm, until that changes i'm gonna keep planting more plants in my enclosures and yeah. switch more of them to that kind of bioactive setup. So I, I think what you're doing is cool. I think, uh, you know, you're, you're pushing this, uh, this philosophy and mm-hmm. I, and I know you're going to get pushed back and you're going to continue to get pushed back. Oh, and, and that's till, till we're, yeah. Till the business folds, we'll get pushed yeah. back and that's, <laughs> and that's okay. You know, but all we can keep doing is just having success and having these sorts of conversations. And, you know, I have talked to breeders. In fact, at NAIBC, uh, a good friend of mine, a breeder, he was like, Hey man, I just bred before. And for the first time I did this whole, you know, thermal gradient thing. And I gave mom access to some heat in the nineties and the baby, they, her and the babies come out every morning and they bask under it and the babies are huge. And, uh, the, he's like, uh, something to it, you know, and, and, you know, and it's that, that's awesome. That's really cool to hear. And I'm glad that people, it's causing people to experiment. And he was, he was just genuinely excited about seeing these behaviors he hadn't seen before. Right. So, um, and I think you can do that too. You can do that at home and, and then just decide, Hey, that that's cool. You know, it worked, you know, you have to be careful. You have to think you can't, like I said, we can't, again, we can't blast them with the sun in a little glass box. You got to think a little bit, but it's another element and the animals do benefit. So, um, but it's not like you have to, I just want to, I want us to get away from that black and white, you know, right. stuff that was happening in the thirties where boo-boos happened and animals died and we're, we're moving on. Yeah. Like no, 30 years ago. I'm oh, saying, okay. Yeah. Not in the thirties. Maybe <laughs> like, these things were happening. Maybe we can go back to the eighties or nineties. Yeah. Know, let's go back 30s. only like 20 years or so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on boats. Right. Yeah. Dead. Yeah. Um, anyway, but, but that's yeah. what I'm. That's what I'm getting at. But here's the problem, man. Here's your problem. I'm gonna tell you mm-hmm. what your problem is. I'm, that's okay. why you, you wanted to be on my podcast. Yes, so I, I did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you convince somebody to change the way that they do husbandry. Mm-hmm. You're essentially convincing them to admit that they were wrong. You know, does that make sense? Like you that, hit that it right on the head. Pushback. Oh. I think a lot of the ego that I come up against uh, with people, mm-hmm. it has to do with that. It's like. This is what I've taught. This is what I've done. This is what I'm on the record saying is the way to do it. If I change, then I'm either admitting I was wrong or that I don't know as much as I claim. Sure. Like there's something, there's some humility in changing and admitting you're wrong or admitting maybe there's a better way to do it and growing. The more you know, the more you grow kind of situation. Mm -hmm. I think there's, I I don't think it's always, I think it's, I guess there's always an aspect of human nature that's been that way. Cause my dad for sure was like that. Sure. Like, he was always right. He was never wrong. Even when he was wrong, he was still right. Cause he was yes. like that. Yeah. And I would say in the past 
oh, I don't know, 10, 15, since social media. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm an old man. I get off my lawn. Social media is destroying the world. But I feel like it, it's really turned everything into this side or that side. Yeah, that man. Situation. You're yeah, right. I hate it. And it happens in the tarantula hobby and the exotic pet hobby as well. It's like you're on yeah. either team A or you're on team B. and It's so sad. There's no because subtlety between the two. And it's it's frustrating. It's very frustrating. And and, and that's where my, my background is different because I failed a lot, guys. I failed so many times professionally as a zookeeper trying to... Re- I, again, I was working with endangered species. The animals I was working with were property of respective governments. My job was completely measured by how well I was able to reproduce the animals and put them back in their respective environments, right? So, and, and I'm just so used to failing and doing things wrong and being, you know, in my opinion, just being shattered by people who are so much smarter than me and like, you know, had done it the correct way or thought my experiment was stupid. So like, you know, I, I would love to be like, okay, you know, it's actually true. The animals don't throw them or regulate. You don't have to keep the animals this way. It's cheaper to just put them in a shoebox. Just go about your business. Like that would be so much easier. Trust me. <laughs> Trust me, guys. Yeah. It'd be so much easier to do that, you know, but um, I, you're right, you're Richard. You're absolutely right. And uh, I know, I know ego is a big thing even in even in zoology even in zookeeping is a huge thing i just but anytime I've, any kind of change like this takes place and not just this i mean like any change anything, anything yeah anywhere in the world it it's usually kind of incremental yep. and it happens because people like you continually are pushing the right. negative or pushing the topic and, right. and and it requires people to have an open mind and i think that's yeah. what we're, that's what we're lacking as a society in general is mm-hmm. that kind of open mindedness the humility and the ability to like live and let live like i agree you know, and I think that's part of the reason that I never want to leave where I live now in, mm-hmm. in West Virginia, because it's, it's, there are definitely some extremely conservative viewpoints and some, ex, it's a weird mix because you've got like hardcore Trump supporters that, you know, coal miners that live and breathe everything. Oh yeah. And that, that party says, and then you, on the next hauler, like over on the next hill, yes. there's hippies that are living off the grid. And We and live in a very the, similar place. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. Like a weird mix of like the two extremes. Yep. And everybody gets along. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, that's an exaggeration. But for the sure. most part, we there can be small communities. Everybody, yeah. you know who your neighbors are. You got it. There's like a grocery store. There's a gas station. There's a, you know what I mean? There's, yes. a, place, there's a barber. There's a beauty salon. Like, you all kind of have to work together. And yes. despite your different views politically or religiously or whatever. And I feel like that that open-mindedness and which is really pushed on here like in the big live and let live thing like, yeah it doesn't matter what they're doing on their property it's not hurting me so i want to mind my own business and right, correct and i yeah. think on, online that is completely gone because there are so many people that will criticize you for your husbandry but not oh, give you man. any tips on what to do better just hey that, that's yeah hard. that's too much you know they just want to destroy you and tell you everything that you're doing wrong and then never correct. change anything that they're doing. That's and correct. Yeah. I feel like myself, that's kind of like why I enjoy people like Dark Den or Tarantula Cat. Um, mm-hmm. and, some, and then it's something that I try to emulate in my videos as well is it's not a Bible. It's a story, a progression. Like you're seeing, yes. you can go back, watch one of Tarantula Cat's first videos. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she erased, I think she hid some of them, but whatever the earliest ones you can see and see how she's taking care of her tarantulas and then compare it to how she's doing it now. And yeah. you can see there's growth there. The, exactly. there, there was trial and error. There was new concepts brought in and incorporated. And the, yeah, so I, I think that that's something I want to do as well. Be a good keeper. The more you, the, you know, you know better, you do better. I feel like yeah. I say that all the time in these podcasts and in videos. Uh-huh. But it's a really important point. I think has to get out there that just because somebody's idea is new doesn't mm-hmm. mean it's wrong. And right. because it might go against what we were uh, traditionally taught, that doesn't mean that it's wrong. Like, because uh, there, there's, I feel like the tarantula husbandry is a pendulum and it was mm-hmm. like really, really basic. And then, you know, I have, keep them on sterilite and, uh, oh, I think was, was oh, perlite it? or, uh, oh, that's what it was. Vermiculite. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. That's, that was the one. That is what it was. Vermiculite. Yep. Yeah. And, and have a light bulb and a screen lid and a 10 gallon aquarium like right. that. The glitter or what was the other thing they suggested? Cork bark, not cork cocoa fiber, but like the, the little, like you would use for reptiles back in the day. Yeah, the ch- like, oh, chunks. Like, or, uh, yeah, whatever. chips of yeah, cork yeah. or chips yep. of wood. Like oh, yeah, wood chips. Yeah, yeah yes. My yeah. tarantula's on, and that's what I did for years. And, yeah. I mean, the, the book that you were, you know what I mean? Like I do. And so that's changed. So we have to kind of acknowledge that things are going to change. And, yeah, man. and maybe, you know, I mean, it sounds like you've done a lot of research. You've, you've Got a lot of experience, um, a lot of different avenues of information that you're kind of internalizing and I'm applying them to your tarantula care. And I think the fact that you're actually a breeder and a dealer adds a whole nother level 
culture of kind of, um, I don't even know what the word is, but it, people should spend to give it more of a chance than maybe if it sure. was just like a random dude online. Cause like this dude has a whole lot more tarantulas than most of us will ever dream of just cause you're breeding them and taking care of them every day. It's right. your full-time job. So you're working with them a lot yeah. and you're pushing something that is saying, take better care of them, not less care. Like, right. I, and I say that only because I've been doing a lot of shows this summer, talking to people. Yes. And one of the feedbacks I've been getting from a lot of breeders is that I'm doing too much. Like the enclosures are too big. They're too fancy. I'm feeding them too often. Yeah. Uh, and it, like, instead of feeding them every week, four crickets, just feed them once a month, you know, and, and give them like 20. That's like, mm -hmm. I could do that. You could. But then, I will lose that interaction on a weekly basis. Like, I, yeah, I'm feeding them, but I also enjoy watching them eat. And I learn a lot. Like I, I'm spending time at their enclosure, watching their behavior, seeing yeah. if there's mushrooms starting to grow or, you know what I mean? Like you, if you're only visiting them like that once a month, you're not, at, you're not as intimately involved in their care as if it was a weekly or a bi-weekly kind of thing. So it I may agree. be a little bit more work, but I feel like in the end, it's a lot more rewarding for both the keeper and the kept. 100% dude. Yeah, it is a lot of work. Trust me. Like yeah. I keep saying, it would be so much easier for me to just go to shoeboxes and stack them floor to ceiling. It really, it really would. Like, really. We spend a lot of time. We spend a lot of money instead of growing the business into pouring it into the welfare of our spiders, you know? So yeah, it, it, it would be easier. But So the theme of this, con of this whole podcast, I guess, has been open-mindedness. <laughs> yes, please. Yeah, because I think when, if, if everyone gives that a shot, we'll start seeing uh, the shift that I'm kind of talking about here. More more ideas, because guys, I learn something every day, every single day, you know, especially when like Richard was just talking about, I actually spend the time to watch my spiders, which doesn't happen very often because I got to get orders out and I got to, you know, I'm taking people's money. So I got to fulfill orders and I got to, you know, deal with customer care and whatnot. But when I, when I want to yes. watch them, I, I learn a, I learn quite a bit. And I'm, I learned something the other day from someone uh, about breeding we'll talk about it later but you know it's just there's there's so much we're still learning there's i i, I have this theory that we still know nothing we yeah. know nothing we're trying to recreate something that's impossible to re recreate you're right dude i think this is this is change starts like this having these conversations yeah. so yeah I, I think a good way to describe it is we've we've learned enough now to know that we don't know anything you know that, Correct. That there it is yeah right. there it is yep you're right <laughs> we thought we knew what we were doing for quite a while and then we've learned enough now to be like oh wait maybe we were You've been wrong this entire time. Yeah, and that's a scary place sense. to be for a lot of people that, that yeah. really find comfort in certainty and, uh, you know, just that kind of mm -hmm. repetition. So, you know, new things are scary and new concepts and ideas that go against what they've been taught and that they may challenge what they think can be yes. difficult. People have been the hardest thing about this. Yeah, it's not, it's not <laughs> the animals. Yeah, it's just trying to go about saying what I'm trying to say in a, in a productive, positive way. You know, that doesn't yeah. spark that reaction of like, no. We're not, we're not going to do that. You know, right. we're not even, gonna, we're not going to think about that. You know, and it, it's it, it, it infinitely more difficult to be able to do it within the parameters of a few sentences in the comment section of a social. That, yeah, man. So that guys, that is so hard to navigate, especially for new people like you. There's no possible way. That's why I keep saying we're not asking enough questions to break down parameters. Like there's no yeah. possible way to diagnose something that you're seeing in a picture like completely and to fully understand and to, uh, you know, instead of just screaming, every, I feel just like everyone's just screaming, you know, yeah. like everyone's very loud. You know, I think we one of my least people. favorite things, like, especially on Facebook now is somebody will join a Facebook group. They'll be really excited. Hey, I just bought my first tarantula or I'm about to buy my first tarantula. I can yeah. some tips on how to take care of a green bottle blue. Mm -hmm. And within the first few comments, there's some asshole that's like, Google it, do your research before you buy a spider. And it's like, ideally in a perfect world, everyone would do their research before buying an animal. But in yes. reality, I would say maybe 20% do. A lot I of that's agree. impulse buy, especially your first spider. Like maybe every spider after that, you might research beforehand. But yeah. that first one was like, it's in front of you. You got the money. You're excited. It's a new pet. You Dude, figure, that, like, I've done it. Yeah, oh, I've done I've it. Definitely done it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. But the whole thing, like Google it, do your research. Like right. that is the worst advice you can give somebody. That now. is not constructive. Like it, there's just so many different websites. Yep. Uh, and and a lot of them, you Google how to take care of a green bottle blue tarantula. I guarantee you're on at least 20 different websites with care sheets and they're not going to be the same. Correct. And and some of them will be because it's just, and I'm not going to call out any of these websites by name because I don't know who they are, but I know that I have posted a care sheet on my website mm -hmm. in a month. They have a care sheet on that same species on their website. They essentially copied and pasted yep. my care sheet and put it on their website and then dropped in 
uh, Amazon links for mm. enclosures that I didn't recommend. Like they changed whatever enclosure I recommended to whatever it is they have an affiliate link on Amazon for. And I'm like, man, that, uh, there's hey, they changed enough. You can't claim copyright or anything like that. And I, I got you. Information from somebody else anyways. So I can't really copyright. But you know, it's it's frustrating. Oh, yeah. That some of the changes made to these care sheets are so that they can sell products on Amazon that don't really fit and aren't the best idea. Yeah. But what is best, there's an affiliate link. So they're not, you oh. know, it's, it's their side hustle. They're trying to make money, but it's like some of those that were made 10 years ago and they haven't, right. made, you know, right. and, and then right. 10 years from now, that might still be available. And now it's yeah, 20 man. years old or 30 years old and it's not getting updated because it's still getting traffic and the way the algorithms work, it's yes. based on how many people are going. So sometimes the old bad information comes to the top. Yeah, it does. I still hear it. We hear it every day. Yeah. yeah. That's where all my frustration has come from. I'm like, somebody, somebody, yeah. uh, like, let's please address this. But yeah, man, you're right. So I feel it's like dangerous, we've been talking you know? for two hours we and have. I don't feel like we've even scratched the surface of yeah, everything that we could talk about, which you're is right. kind of frustrating. <laughs> uh, especially <laughs> the people world. listening. They're kind of like, okay, well, that was okay. like, what about this? And it's And I feel like this is almost like a, we have to do a series of podcasts. Yeah, man, let's just please, let's actually, let's let them respond. And if there's questions, let's make notes. Like I would do it at any time. I would love to come and tackle stuff, you know, because yeah. and that's the way it has to be. It can't just, it's not, we're not going to enca- encapsulate anything in two hours. Like we're not even scratching yeah. the surface. So yeah, I think it just needs to more conversations like this and having guests on other people with different point of views or different experiences, like all of us yeah. collaborating and then somehow like getting that into the, the ears and the eyes of, customers, I think is what, what it's going to take, you know, I agree. Just, like yeah. I, I feel strongly that no matter what the topic is in life, having long form conversations is much more beneficial than yep. posting memes or, uh, changing the sentence in your profile on Correct. social media. And Correct. It, I mean, these are topics that I can't even adequately address in a 10 to 15 minute video, of just me talking. Correct. How can I do that in a post on Facebook or especially in a comment? Like, yeah. 200 like, characters. Not, not possible. You're not changing anybody's minds or opinions. Yeah. You know, on a, on a snarky little comment on a Facebook. Correct. You know, that's not, it's not doing anything good, but having conversations like this, from mm-hmm. two people that maybe see things a little bit differently, I yes. think is, is very beneficial. And we didn't argue the entire time. No. You, you didn't call me one name. No, I didn't. <laughs> Vice amazing? versa, you know what I mean? So, <laughs> Well, I got a mute button, so I just muted it. Oh, there you Your name like that. <laughs> okay, got it. Brian is such a... I saw him I disappear know. here and there. Yeah, so that's probably what was going on. And that's okay. I deserve it. <laughs> but this has been a good conversation, man. And I definitely think we should have more conversations like this because, I mean, we just kind of talked about husbandry and there's yeah. so many other, th- I mean, other things I want to, because I know that just based on, we're two people that like tarantulas and we like spiders, we like inverts, we like exotic animals, uh, but we got two different backgrounds. We're coming from two different perspectives, both, I mean, from like a, a moral standpoint, maybe, but also from like a business standpoint. And, yeah. You know what I mean? Like there's a lot mm-hmm. of, a lot of different, we're, we're two people with the same passion for different reasons, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Yes. That makes sense. Yeah, I agree, man. And not limited to just inverts too. Like you, you keep yeah. a lot of different animals. Yeah. And my background is actually herps, amphibians in, in particular. So yeah. there's, there's so much we could tackle, man. I mean, seriously. Um, yeah. But I think having this cohesive, these cohesive conversations, it, like it, it's the way to go for sure. I'm really excited, man. So thank so you for you having me on. on. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you coming on, man. And if you're listening yeah. on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or whatever, <laughs> or even if you're watching us on YouTube, uh, leave a comment down below um, and, you know, l- just let us know what you thought about this conversation. What you think about Ryan? Is he an idiot? Is he a, is he a, a genuine guy? <laughs> yeah. just, don't, don't call him an idiot. That's just, that's okay. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I mean, it's been a good conversation. I'd love to have him back on. Maybe, you know, it, we could discuss together other topics or we could bring on a guest and talk to the guest, but have two different kind of viewpoints in, in interviewing the person. I it just, I just, I feel like there's a lot of potential here to have. 100%. conversations yeah. about topics that are, you know, maybe not even controversial, just set in stone that maybe don't need to be set as as hard in stone as they are. So to I speak. agree. Yeah. So, uh, if you guys want to see Ryan on this uh, podcast more often, be sure to leave a comment down below and let me know. If you're listening on Spotify or somewhere where you can't leave a comment, just make sure you rate the podcast five-star review because that will help get it out to other people. And then just leave a comment on my Instagram or Ryan's Instagram uh, or Facebook or wherever social media you are on and you're following us and you see, just drop a comment down there uh, and let us know what you thought about the podcast and maybe doing this more in the future together. And uh, and, and if you guys enjoyed it and it's something that does well, well I'll definitely have to have him come back on and uh, tell me why I'm wrong. 
<laughs> I think that's constructive. Really yeah, that helps too. <laughs> it's all constructive. So, but yeah, well, Ryan, thank you so much for coming on and and being a good sport. And uh, I hope. I know you didn't get everything out that you wanted to say, but it's like two hours. So we got, yeah, to not even close, man, but this is a great start, man. And I really appreciate you taking the time and doing yeah. it. Super cool. Very yeah, awesome. We'll definitely have to do this again. And just, uh, I know you said you didn't want to promote your business, but just so people know how to get in touch with you, if they do want to tell you something like tell you sure. that you're a, a incredible genius or you're an absolute idiot. <laughs> Either one. Yeah. We'll take it all. Uh, Jess will be probably be the one you're talking to. So that'll make it even more fun if you make fun of me and you're talking to Jess, but uh, we're on all the social media accounts, Twitter, um, Facebook, Instagram, um, and then marshallarachnids at gmail.com. You can email us or you can visit us at marshallarachnids.com for uh, check us out, see what we're all about. We do have care sheets on there, blah, blah, blah. So, but I we're always open to talk. I don't think you said it, but they can follow you on Instagram and Facebook and all that. Yep. Your name there is Marshall Arachnids. Yep. So yep. At Marshall Arachnids. Yeah. I don't know how it works. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah. You'll you find it. You can follow me. I was like, well, I don't know if that's because I know like my Twitter handle isn't Tarantula Collective. Oh, it's it. all Marshall Arachnids. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. Tarantula Co. One. So, okay. Yeah. Well, everybody, Ryan from Marshall Arachnids, give him a big hand and uh, say thanks for coming on and be willing to talk. And it was good meeting you in person. Hopefully, we run into each other again in the future so. at, a, at a new expo. Really, yeah. what you need to do is just come to West Virginia and come to. Come I to think that's the next step. Yeah. I keep calling it my expo when I'm talking to people, and I have nothing to do. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes he gives me a free table if i come that's yeah enough. yeah <laughs> we'll, we'll, really come, nice we'll come to your expo yeah yeah but yeah that would be awesome to have <laughs> that'd be cool dude i'd love hey it guys we all enjoy your week and uh come back next week because uh we've got more podcasts coming and uh hopefully brian will be on some of them all right you guys have a great day don't forget to like and subscribe follow all that fun stuff and we will see you in the next podcast goodbye see ya a terrible podcast by Tarantula Collective.